Hey, it's Mr. Beat here. I hope you're doing well. Thanks for being here. This is 10 Questions. It's a, a show, program, podcast, live stream, whatever you want to call it. And the deal is I ask 10 questions to another YouTuber, TikToker, creator, video creator, and then they ask me 10 questions as well. So we go back and forth and the questions are uh, supposed to be open-ended. So usually it leads to a wonderful conversation. This time I have Jabril from Jabril's. Yes. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, oh yeah, he, not on camera yet. So there's like, that is, that's his voice though. Where's I'm voice? a ghost, 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 <laughs> ghost. <laughs> Did you hear that? Okay. Well, but before I bring him on, um, uh, just a few things about, uh, Jabril, uh, real name, Jabril Ash. And he actually started like back in the day with early, like when I started. So we're talking several years ago. Uh, he's worked with physics girl used to, um, edit, uh, her videos. Uh, he, he's worked, uh, he was on crash course, uh, for the AI, um, series that they did or course or whatever you call it. Uh, they did a, a few years back. Um, but his main channel, uh, Oh, oh, yeah, and he had a comedy channel at one point that he helped out with, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, I don't even know if he knows that I watch that stuff, <laughs> <laughs> but I have a comedy channel, too. Uh, not many people know about. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, as, as far as his channel, it's mostly like, um, I would say, um, computer programming based, gaming a little bit, uh, machine learning, AI but the main reason why I literally watch every video he releases is because he's just a likable dude. Uh, every time I, I actually, I, I've known him since about, I think 2017, I, I was trying to think back when I first met him. And every time I've seen him in person, like he just brings me so much joy. I love being around him. So uh, without any further talking, uh, rambling by me, let's bring on uh, Jabril, welcome. You're on camera now. <laughs> Dog crap. Now you're muted. Sorry. Okay. My my mouse is so bad. It, like, it's <laughs> dying on me. So, anyways, uh, thank you so much for the intro. That was very, very heart touching. Uh, and thanks for carbon dating me, by the way. I am an ancient old man in internet years. Uh, I you, got you some years. weren't able to tell. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the love is mutual, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I always enjoy uh, running into you and your wife. Um, <laughs> great times. I can't wait to see you again, man. <laughs> We've literally run into each other like uh, all over the country. I was thinking about this. Like we first met in, in California, which you're from California. Uh, but then I think we, we we saw each other in Austin. So in the South mm. and also Alabama. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, and then New York City. Uh, yeah. Anywhere else. True. Just, you just need to come to the middle here in Kansas. That's that's what's left. Yeah. Hey, give me give me an invite. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you'll be disappointed. But uh Anyway, I, yeah, no, so um, anything I left out, like you want to share with my viewers that are not familiar with uh, the, the, your videos, you also have like a really unique editing style. Like, uh, do you remember, like you were known for a while, like you would be on camera, but your voice would be off yeah. camera. That was a very unique thing. Like, why'd you stop doing that? Yeah, it was fun, uh, but it hit a point where it was just taking too much time. Like, it's interesting. Like, it was a solution to make editing go faster. But then I I just discovered a faster way to edit videos. And so I switched over to that. And a lot of people are always like, oh, I bring back the real Jabril's. He doesn't talk. And, like, you know, I feel kind of bad. But at the same time, like, you know, I'm trying to make content in a decent amount of time for the audience. And that's just one thing that helps. Yeah. Well, and then you've you also do like you work on projects that last a long time. And so that's also why I've noticed that like your releasing of videos is sporadic because like you'll spend six months on something. Right. Or I don't know. Like so. Yeah. yeah. You want to go into that a little bit more? <laughs> How dare you re-traumatize me? <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, no, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the last few years has, has been really interesting. Um, I. I uploaded a video about this on my channel where I talked about how from 2000, I think it was 17 to 2020, I was like on the YouTube grind, like making YouTube videos, like two, at least one or two times a month uploading, right? All the while making computer science projects. And it was like really intensive. 
Um, and then I look up like in 2020, I'm like, oh my God, hold on a second. Like I made some decent amount of money from this. Like I can now use this money to try and like invest it in other things. So from 20, from 2020 to like 2020, well, 2024, for being honest, I was just using most of that time to invest in projects off, off YouTube. And then I realized that that was probably not the smartest thing. It was a lot of fun, but <laughs> you know, all the eggs are definitely on YouTube. So now I'm back to creating content once a month. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I saw your last video. I know you were kind of explaining what you just said. And I, yeah, yeah I, I hear you about the grind. It's like, I want to do these bigger, more ambitious uh, projects as well. And I, I just feel like I, every time I want to do it, I kind of get sucked back in. It's like, cause you can't lose momentum on this platform because your viewers will forget about you. Like, uh, yeah. like yeah. I, Shout out to my friend. Uh, well, you, ha, have you met? Um, you met Will Fox, right? From uh, Exploring History. Uh, uh, probably would recognize him. I think so. I think so. Well, Curly he, hair with the glasses, right? Or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. He uh, took a break from YouTube and came back, and he just he's been trying to like get back to where he was this whole yeah. time, you know. And he's he's trying to do it full time here. Um, Actually, he just went back full time into it. So mm -hmm. I think he'll get there, but it's just like it sucks because. Yeah, everyone well, forgets about you. <laughs> well, listen, honestly, this might be a little controversial. I think that's a good thing. I, I'm currently in the same position where like the audience that I used to upload to is they're not all fully there anymore. And the ones that are there, like, you know, they're kind of halfway in, halfway out because so many creators have came and gone and like uh evolved what has been since i left right but i think it's good because like in just business nothing stays static right like you have to constantly be involving your craft and figuring out you know how do you one up the competition and I i'm now in this position where i realize that things are not the same as when i left and i shouldn't expect them to be the same as when i left therefore i have to observe the landscape and figure out like what can i uniquely contribute to the youtube platform and it's been really challenging, but I'm really confident that I will figure out, you know, how to, you know, maneuver my way back into where I was and maybe even greater than that. Yeah, it's, a lot really, of fun, so. it's about shorts now, really. Still, it's been that way for a couple of years. That's why, honestly, I, I thankfully enjoy making shorts. And so I think that's my what I'm going to do more of, actually, to kind of keep mm. sane because they're easy to make. And yeah. They do, do, you, well. do you see a funnel of shorts to, to long form? A very, uh, a little bit, very yeah. <laughs> narrow funnel. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because most of the folks that watch my shorts don't watch my long form. Um, right. But I think the main thing is that like, there's that, um, there's a few that watch both. And so I, I think it just kind of keeps me relevant. But you do make a good point. It is sometimes good to just disappear completely. Um, it's very I, I, rewarding. I'll tell you, if you have some side yeah. projects you've thinking about for years, just put your little budget aside for the next year, whatever it is, and then just go for it. Like it's, it's very rewarding. Fail or succeed. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Well, hopefully this will get, give you a little bit more momentum when you're getting back into the monthly videos. Uh, not that I have much sway on this, uh, <laughs> on the interwebs, but uh, yeah. So I guess we can just jump into the questions. Um, Let's do it. Yeah, so I put this little tracker up here for everyone. And then chat, if I'll try to like, if you have a super chat, you're actually donating money. I kind of feel bad if I don't try to answer those. So I try to answer those every once in a while. But generally, we go to oh. uh, two to three hours, and I don't want to take too much of your time because it's just an honor that you're here. And <laughs> yeah, uh, but I'll start us off. <laughs> okay. Um, and I told you uh, when, before we went on the air that it was like, oh, crap, a lot of these questions are AI, about AI. But maybe that's what everyone's thinking about anyway. So um, let's see here, though. Uh, I guess I'll start with that. We're, we were talking about YouTube and how YouTube is changing. What I've noticed, uh, especially the past six months or so, is there's a lot of um, AI channels that are actually getting a lot of views. Yeah. And YouTube doesn't seem to care about it. So my question for you is, uh, it's kind of multifaceted, but what do you think YouTube can do to fight AI-generated content? Or 
Maybe it doesn't want to fight it. Maybe it's just kind of let it do its thing. So what are your feelings on that? Mm. Yeah, I generated content on this platform. It's a great question. I, I first I'm gonna have a call to Marquise in the YouTube chat. Uh he did gift me this sweater. So oh shouts to Marquise in the YouTube chat. Okay, so the question. Um why so hmm. I think that like something like this needs to be examined on what exactly are we talking about when we say AI generated content, right? Uh, well, I can make it clear. Okay. I mean, everything is so from the the writing, research and writing, which is mostly mm -hmm. based off of, um, yeah, chat GPT, um, but then other programs for the images, animation, like literally from beginning to end, um, the only thing that the human has to do is upload the video mm -hmm. um, in terms of, because all no creation uh, by a human at all. Um. So then who... Press the generate button. Ooh, I like what you're doing here. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I, mean right. it's, I mean, honestly, like I, I, I think I love this question just because it really taps into like what is creativity, right? And this content that I think when when you hear AI generated content as the, like the average person, I think a lot of people assume that like AI has full control over every aspect of the content. But this is very often, uh, very rarely the case. Off, like I don't know if you've seen the uh, it's the president's playing video games uh, YouTube channel. Have you seen this? Yeah, I there have. is a lot of human input that goes into that content, like a lot. Even when you talk about like the the musicians, uh, Drake AI generated songs, like there is a lot of human input that goes into these things, mm -hmm. um, which is something I think is often missing from the conversation now. Let's fast forward into the future, right? Let's say that we get to a point where you can just click one button and it creates content for you and uploads it for you on whatever cadence that you want it to, right? I personally don't have a problem with that. I think that's fine, right? Because if the AI is able to do that on its own and there's an audience that wants to consume that and watch and enjoy it, what, what's the issue, right? <laughs> is the audience not always in charge of what we consume, right? Like we have reality television. <laughs> Like, that is arguably worse than anything an AI can can possibly generate, in my personal opinion. True. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, I I want to counter that and say, hey, um, audiences can be terrifying. Like you know the old George, George Carlin bit. Like he says, oh, a person. I love a person, but a group. Groups are horrible. So like, mm -hmm. I don't know, the whole mob thing. Like. I I do agree. I do agree. But I mean, what is the solution? Like if you have some really like highly intelligent educational piece of content, right? And you you serve that on a silver platter to this group of people and they're like, "We don't want that." What do you do? Do you arrest them? Do you like what do you do? You know? <laughs> yeah. Like they want the trashy stuff. Yeah. You know? Like like when it, when it comes down to it, like the audience is always in control of what gets made. Like one way or another now there's a whole separate conversation on how do we go about like uh changing the culture to to desire the content that maybe you and i prefer but that's a whole other can of worms that like I, i'm not really that versed in yeah now that's maybe the i think should be the <clears throat> point of emphasis is like yeah let's, let's work on changing the culture rather than tastes right now and that's what honestly i feel like a lot of edutubers educators in general what we're doing all the time is just attempting to trick people into actually learning stuff we're yes. just like and yeah like honestly i would not be interested in uh a lot of the content that you make your videos about i would not be interested in it otherwise like i met you that helped that i, I was like oh i know you but also like your personality is what really got locked me in i'm like i really like how you communicate. And I think that's the reason why a lot of folks watch my videos too, is they, I mean, they start to trust me, which I don't know if they should trust me that much, <laughs> but they also like, they just like, yeah, yeah. They like how I tell stories and that's ultimately what we are. We're just communicators. Um, and I think that eventually, yeah, AI will be good enough to do that. But I think it, at the same time, what's happening right now with all these AI channels that exist right now, is people are clicking on them because they figured out the science between like how to get people to click on it with the 
you know, engineered uh, title and thumbnail, and they know like certain keywords in the video. But I don't think that I would like to see the data for like how long people stay on the video. You know, like are people really because these are not storytellers. What do you think about that? I so I'm not entirely sure what AI content you're referring to. Um, do you oh. have any potential examples? Yeah, I can pull one up. I just I tweeted about it the other day. Um, okay. It was just maybe really... that'll get us on the same page. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, let's just play a little quick sample here. I don't want to dwell too much on this. So I came across a channel. It said they have Supreme Court cases. Oh, let me share my screen here. Uh, they, because you know I make a lot of Supreme Court content, and I was like, this got suggested to me, and the channel's called Law School Data. And okay. it's uh, all AI and gener generated stuff, and I, with the angle of Supreme Court cases, so I'll just play. Uh, like, look at these thumbnails. Do you see that? <laughs> I mean, like the Hess, Hess versus Indiana. This is really catch catches my attention here. Like, this is a Supreme Court case. So we'll we'll watch the video. Case briefs and so much more. LS data's got what you're looking for. In 1973, a precedent-setting case known as Hess v. Indiana made its way to the U.S. Supreme Court. The landmark case underscored the principle that an individual cannot be punished by the government for speaking their mind unless those specific words incite violence, are offensive or obscene, or aimed at an individual or group in such a way as to provoke violence. The case was cemented in history following an incident involving a man named Gregory Hess. During an anti-war protest, Hess was arrested and charged with disorderly conduct for his vocal contributions that included the use of a vulgar word. Of note, his expression was not aimed at anyone in particular. <laughs> Following orders from the police to disperse, the demonstrators, including Hess, found themselves slowly being corralled off the street by the approaching sheriff. It was then that Hess, now off the street, made the controversial statement. Disputing his arrest, Hess legally- Oh yeah, look at that gavel. That's so beautiful. How do you use that? Broad, lacked clarity and amounted to a violation of his freedom of speech. Backed by his what appeal. What flag was that? <laughs> okay. of Indiana. The Supreme Court, upon hearing Supreme Court appeal, grew. agreed with Hess's argument. Okay, okay, we can pause it. <laughs> okay, you got enough there. But this, um, is, this has my, 418 views. My first question is, do you know if that was factual information or not? This is a case I'm not familiar with. Okay. Uh, I'm assuming that most of the facts are okay. But yeah, clearly the storytelling is lacking and it's yeah. just random pictures that were generated. So it has a long ways to go, but, you know, um, yeah. it'll get better. I guess my, I guess my question is just, just like really directly, what's the issue with this content in, in, th in your eyes? <clears throat> in my eyes, I think that um, it's not good. And so it shouldn't be recommended. Uh, like objectively not good. I don't see how anyone likes this, but maybe they do. Maybe I'm being too pretentious here. Um, I Now, I, I fully recognize that within a few years, it's going to be so much better than this. Um, and that's fine. But <clears throat> right now, I think it's weird that YouTube is promoting this stuff to me, especially me, like someone who I'm always searching uh, law videos, you know, because I make law videos and I'm always seeing what else is out there, and then they they think I will like this. Why would they think that I would like this? Okay. <laughs> no, I love this. This is this is so fascinating to me. I, I I wish you had more conversations like this. Um. Okay. So, I think the first thing that is interesting to me when I look at the content is that it has 418 views over six months. So that's that's about 69, 70 views a month or something like that over over its course, which is not a lot comparative to how many people consume YouTube content. Right. And. In terms of it being good or not, that's a really interesting argument, because <laughs> like, let's say I have like a baby cousin. Right. And my baby cousin is passionate about law cases. Right. And my baby cousin uh, edits a video that's you know not AI generated images, but it's like you can clearly tell it's made by like a like a six year old, five year old, whatever, whatever the age is, right? That would that'd be objectively not good content, right? Just because it's the flow, it's just you know all the things we come to to learn what good content is, it just wouldn't be good content. And so in my mind, I immediately just draw parallels to that, right? Like what my baby cousin would make wouldn't be good content. Neither would the AI what they generate would be good 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 content either, right? 
And to kind of counter the point that you had made is it's not good content. Why is it being recommended to me? I don't know if that's fair. Just because it's not good, I don't think it necessarily means it shouldn't be recommended. Um, hmm. Yeah, that, that was that's my first observation. Um, I'm sorry, my first rebuttal to, to what you had said. Yeah. Um, so many thoughts that are going through my mind right now, but no, it's this is good to push back because I, um. I think part of this is just me like fearing change, which all of us do. And I feel like you're more open-minded than me to this stuff. So it's good to hear these counter arguments because I, I wouldn't mean, what, hear them otherwise. What is, what is creativity, right? Like this example that you're seeing is not good, right? In your opinion. Um, I didn't see what the comments, maybe the comments agree with you. Maybe they disagreed. That's irrelevant. But when it's all said and done, artificial intelligence is a tool, right? Mm -hmm. Just like Photoshop just like Premiere, just like any other tool, right? And yeah. the reason why I'm so anti like banning AI outright or why I'm so pro AI, I should say, is because the next <laughs> Mr. Beast <laughs> is in his bedroom right now, learning how to utilize these tools to create like the next revolution of content, right? And I don't think it's fair that we just outright ban these tools because we fear change. And we don't maybe ne don't necessarily understand it. Um, and we're preventing the potential next like huge creator from being able to use these tools in a democratic way to create the next evolution of content, you know. And is getting the, it when we say all the artificial intelligence is there today is it's getting it from us. It's it's not creating anything. Um, well, it is creating something new, though. That's the, that's the difference is the, the machine learning aspect of it, right? Like it's the first time that like um, because I you you asked what is creativity? Um, yeah. The easy answer that I usually go to and maybe it's wrong is uh, it's just something that wasn't there before is now there. Mm. It's that process. And no one is fully 100 percent creative. Um, because we're all stealing from everyone else. I mean, even as yeah. especially um, educational <laughs> content, to be honest, uh, so much of like what's in my videos is I'm latching on to other things. Like I'm telling uh, about stuff that actually happened. I'm not. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, um, I, I, I get that side of it. Yeah. Cause there really is no true 100% creativity. Yeah. Um, and you know what have made that content better? The AI generated content, if there was more human input, that would have made that content better, right? And yeah, even even what we watched, right? That was not fully AI generated. Like someone had to write the script to make this video output, right? Which or is at human least ar input. arrange it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, in some way, yeah, you know, which right. is human input, right? Okay. All right. Well, I don't want to drag this on too long because we'll go like five hours. So uh, you go you go ahead and ask me your question and we'll, we go back and forth. Because <laughs> I actually I think I asked I actually asked you like five questions just then. So. <laughs> OK, so it's the question that that must be asked. I must know, Mr. Beat. OK. <laughs> Are you ready for this? Yeah. OK. <laughs> Has Mr. Beast had a positive or negative effect on your internet life? Oh, I love this question. Uh, somebody else asked me something similar, but not like that. I like the way you asked it. So I think about this all the time because, you know, it, I think about um, I, I've had a lot of success on uh, YouTube or YouTube in particular. And mm -hmm. I, you know, Matt Beat is my legal name. I was born with that name. Actually, Matthew. I'm sorry, mom, if you're watching. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like, so people still don't believe me that that's my name. And I started my channel before um, Jimmy did. Um, mm -hmm. But I noticed that there was a parallel. Like there was uh, definitely a time when, <laughs> when my channel started to grow more that coincided with when his channel blew up, which was interesting like 20, 2017 2018 something like that and i i don't know how much i mean there's no way to really truly analyze like how much sure. he's benefited my channel but no doubt i've had so many anecdotes of 
people have told me they've emailed me or commented saying they were searching originally for um, his channel and they accidentally stumbled, stumbled upon mine and uh, they stuck around because they liked what they saw. And wow. so I cannot be <laughs> angry at Mr. Beast at all because I, I'm just grateful that I get these extra viewers. Um, I can't quantify how many it's it's been, but I definitely think, think it's been a net positive. Sure, I still get negative comments in terms of people literally think that I stole his name. They think that I'm <laughs> ripping him, his channel off. Yeah. He's like, went to the uh, court and changing your last name. <laughs> like, oh, Mr. Beast wannabe, or you're just uh, capitalizing on his name. I'm like, no, it, it's my name. Uh, my students called me that. That's like literally why I started. I called my channel that because... I started my channel for my students in real life. I didn't start it for an audience outside of my classroom, which is crazy because this, you know, 2011, I'm not thinking I'm going to be a YouTuber. That wasn't really a career choice back then for the vast majority of people. So, but yeah, like it's worked out pretty well considering he's the biggest YouTuber in the world. Uh, yeah. So my short answer is it's been more positive. <laughs> Got it. Change my, my YouTube to Mr. Best. There you go. <laughs> I'm sure there's already a, there's a Mr. Beat apparently in Mexico. Um, hmm. I found out that um, I'm pretty sure it's not their legal name, but, um, but yeah, it's like, that's one of those things too. Like there's so many channel names that are the same these days. If you just search a, a common name, you're going to get dozens yeah. of, of the channels. So it's kind of back to the AI thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you ever come across Mr. Beast or his uh, people? I have not. Oh, uh, Willie from Canubis uh, did, and he's, he told them about me, and they just kind of laughed. I don't even think they believed him. Like, no, he's not real. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. Uh, so let's see. Um, try to make segue here, but I'm just going to go with this is kind of related. So. I saw that you there was a meme that you appeared on the grilled cheese AI meme. Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I remember I was like, oh, I'm also part of a meme because I'll put this on the screen. But um, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, let me just. Yeah, I use DuckDuckGo. Don't judge me. Uh, AI grilled cheese, I think it it's a. Uh, or I have to. Oh, I have to put in meme. Yeah, I think that then then you pop up. Oh, not on not on DuckDuckGo. <laughs> oh, come on, DuckDuckGo, come on. Okay, uh, or maybe it's. I I think I saw it on. There it is. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so this is a meme that you're in. Uh, humanity AI is going to take over the world soon. AI and then grilled cheese <laughs> and it's their fate. <laughs> How did this? Oh wait, it's, it's not even showing up on the screen. Let me hold on. Um, uh, oh, that's not it, it, it. There we go. <laughs> that's the meme. Uh, how did this even happen? Well, this not, that's not my question. Sorry, but I guess you can just briefly say, how did this happen? Like this meme? Yeah, real quick. So I, I created that myself. Uh, there's like facial recognition algorithm I was playing okay. with. And then I just added grilled cheese custom label on it. And then, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I remember seeing this on Reddit um, somewhere. And so that's where I, and then speaking of, uh, which uh, the yeah my the meme that I have found myself a part of was the Mr. Breast uh, give me money uh, because <laughs> it's like the double oh layer yeah th so I this was a video by um, Father John Misty uh, I, I'm a big fan of Father John Misty's music and this is one of his songs and I commented underneath this is well before my channel was that big and I said 2017 was one of the best years in music and music history and here's another example why. I was just assuming no one would ever see that comment. <laughs> and then uh, this fellow named River Watson responded with Mr. Breast, give me money. And uh, yeah, this 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 went crazy um, because it's a double layer there. It's like, first of all, they thought I was Mr. Beast. Second, they called me Mr. Breast. And so that's why like now people even sell the shirts. Um, and so I was like, we, Mrs. B, uh, I was like, Hey, we got to capitalize on this. We need to sell these cause Jack's films is selling this shirt. So anyway, we, you can, you can buy a Mr. Breast give me money shirt on my website. Um, <laughs> that all said, my actual question here is, uh, will our memes outlast our videos? Oh, that's <laughs> a great question. Um, Hmm. You know, my immediate answer is yes. 
because I've come to learn when it comes to content creation, and I, I consider memes as content creation, it's all about like the relatability stickiness, right? <laughs> And I think that you give it like 20 years, I think it, it'd be easier for someone to remember a meme than like the entirety of a video. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think it's just easier, especially when we're uploading like a video a week or a video a month. You know, one meme mm -hmm. goes incredibly viral. I think it's just easier to remember. Yeah, I, I think I might agree with you on this. I, I think about this way too often, like legacy, um, because... Um, even like, I always bring up the example of, uh, Shakespeare. Uh, most people know very little about who Shakespeare was and, and he was who often was that? Shakespeare who was that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first name William. I don't know, but like they know his plays. So his play and what's crazy is that it's one of the few things that survive, um, 500 plus years ago. Um, or I, well, it's barely 500 years. It's not even 500 years. And, um, <laughs> And I think back, well, shoot, a, a 500 years before that was, we we don't really remember anything. That was before the Renaissance. Hmm. And then we have to go back even for like 2,000 years. And then we, oh, okay, oh, yeah, uh, ancient Rome and uh, ancient Greece and then uh, ancient China, all this. But there's only like, I, I walk by a statue, you know, like anytime I walk by, by a statue, I'm, I'm the type of guy, I'll stop and like look at it like, oh, what's this about? But most people don't do that. They just keep on walking. Yeah. And so, so many people are just, uh, you know, so concerned about legacy yeah. when we're all going to be forgotten, you know? And if, in, if we're lucky, we might have one contribution that stays alive, you know? Yeah. That's the way I see it. I think the statue um, example is a really interesting one. I think that when we talk about legacy, right? like what's what's remembered in culture if you will i find that there's there's two different ways to slice it right there's the the legacy that we try to force into culture right so statues and etc cetera, etc cetera. and there's ones that just like naturally spawn into culture right and i think that's where memes lie right it's like mm -hmm. you take a collective group of people that all agree that this is relatable in some way and that that is the legacy that carries it to live on right versus like I made this statue and I'm going to place it here. You must remember me. You know, <laughs> that's a really interesting uh, example. Yeah. So don't build statues because like you're forcing <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> Make memes. <laughs> but the meme, most memes will die too. That's the thing. Like, I wonder yeah. how long even your meme didn't show up with DuckDuckGo. So what does that say? Yeah. I, wonder... <laughs> it says, uh, I need to send a lawsuit to DuckDuckGo. What are you doing? Come on. Yeah. What, what are you doing? I wonder if mine shows up with DuckDuckGo. The I say mine as if I own this meme. I don't no. own this meme. Like this is. Uh, oops. Well, now I just typed in. Okay, so I search in Mr. Breast. Give me money. And okay. Oh, look at that! It's my shirt that I sell. How about that? Good job, okay. DuckDuckGo. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you're, you're I got a fight to pick with you now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My question is, Mr. Beats, yeah. why presidents? Like, where does your passion for presidents come from? Oh, oh, yeah. Um, well, let's see. Uh, it comes from this book right here. Facts and fun about the presidents. No, <laughs> seriously, like this is a big. <laughs> I got this when I was in like second or third or fourth grade elementary school. And I. Uh, I found it fascinating. And that's just one thing, obviously. Other things that I think when I was a kid, I was always like, I. they always teach you about Abraham Lincoln, you know, like the big top hat and everything and how he was just like, he was just a regular dude. He mm -hmm. was uh, somebody that taught himself how to read. He didn't even go to school that much. Um, and, you know, he worked hard and was chopping wood <laughs> in Kentucky and Indiana. Then he went to Illinois to become a lawyer again, self-taught passed some kind of test to show that he's a lawyer. Then he ran for politics and yeah, came, went all the way to the most powerful position in the country. And now today it's the most powerful position in the world. And it's just ordinary people. Um, so that's always fascinated me. It's not like it's the opposite of royalty. Um, and I've always been 
a firm believer in like, you know, uh, you, you should be able to do what you want and you should, uh, I guess, well, that's also when I first learned about like, um, certain cultures, how like, um, there's a caste system, like a caste system. When I first found out about that, I got angry. I was like, <laughs> No, I choose my own destiny. I'm not stuck to, you know, like, and also like why I'm very anti-monarchy and anti, you know, just like people born into pri privilege and they don't earn anything. Uh, and I shouldn't get so worked up about it, but that's also related because yeah, presidents, a lot of the, the presidents were actually um, just, they come from humble background. Um, one of my favorite presidents is Harry Truman. Uh, he came from near where I live and I'm making a video about him right now. And, uh, even after he left office, he had a, he, you know, he went back to his normal life. Um, he didn't even have, this is before they got secret service for the rest of their life. So he just, huh. people would, would hang out in his yard and he'd have to tell him to leave. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> and he, it's the same house he lived in before he became a Senator. And mm. so, yeah, that aspect of it, like kind of, um, although we know, I, I have to say this, there's been a lot of presidents who did come from privilege and, uh, you know, sure. nepotism, but that aside. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I guess like, I, I'm just curious, like, like beyond the book, like why presidents though? Like why not like Thomas oh. Edison or Henry Ford or, you know? Oh why? yeah. I think it's just my love of political history. And like, mm. I'm fascinated by power. Like, mm. why is it that, that person can do so much and other people can't like, I see. And, and people that say they're not interested in politics, I always like get triggered because I'm like, well, that's bull crap. If you, <laughs> if you gossip, you're interested in politics. Like anytime you have more than one person in a room, that's politics. There's always a power dynamic going on. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, that's why I like people watching too, like just sitting on a bench in, in a park or something and watching interactions. Like, cause you see politics in real time you see who's like trying to dominate versus the other person. Like even me and you talking right now, I'm always like cognizant of like, I don't want to talk too much. Cause like, <laughs> Oh yeah. I got to lower my seat. There we go. <laughs> You're you showing the bro? dominance. Bro, what are you saying, bro? <laughs> <laughs> Someone just screen sh screenshot that. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. So does that answer? Yeah. Make sense. Okay. That makes sense to me. I get it. I think that you have like a, a a more holistic view of what politics means that I don't think like the average person sees it that way. But when you explain it, that, that makes sense to me. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. Okay. Well, um, let's see if I can I think it's for time for my next question here. Uh, if you're just joining us, this is a uh, Jabril from Jabril's uh, <laughs> subscribe to his channel. I, I think uh, I put a link in the description. If not, I'll do that later. Um, okay. What is the uh, craziest project you've ever worked on? I kind of hate this question. Oh, dang it. No, it's not It's not your fault. <laughs> it's my own fault. But the reason why I hate this question, because my answer is always what I'm working on now. <laughs> oh. It just always is. I have this super crazy project that I'm currently working on that I'm not even sure if it's going to work or not. But if it does, it's the beat. If it does, oh my goodness. Oh Can you tell us goodness. much about it or do you not want to reveal much? Um, I will just say this, okay? Uh, online multiplayer games are very popular. People love playing online multiplayer games, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the biggest limits that I have uh, observed my entire life is the amount of players that can play together at the same time. I think I might have, all right, I don't want to jinx it. I think I might have figured out a way to allow probably up to a million players to play at the same time together. Maybe. Still working on it. <laughs> but if I figure wow. that out, the video is going to be so much fun. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, just the process. That's the thing. Like with your videos, if people aren't aware, like a lot of times you are, you're failing. Let's just be honest. You're failing yeah. as you're doing this, but it doesn't matter because that's part of life, you know? And you're yeah. just, so that's, what's so fun about it is like, Oh, is this going to work? Hold, that's, it's insane. Uh, yeah. 
yeah, I will talk about hype. Uh, I'm looking forward to that one. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. It's we got delivery, exciting. delivery boy Roy. Come on now, don't be cynical. Glass half full, <laughs> Doomer. I mean, look, I look. It's a, it's a fair argument. Too many players potentially, but I, I you know, w- one thing I've learned being a, a game developer for the past like 15, 20 years of my life is that like people love to criticize what they don't understand, right? Like not to, not to, you know, take away from what uh, the last comment was saying, but like you haven't even played the game yet. Like you have no idea how it's designed. Like you're, mm-hmm. you're already criticizing something. You don't even know like how it works, you know, but switch their own. You know, speaking of gaming, I just think a lot of times the, the people that criticize online, it's they're trying to level up themselves. They, unfortunately, they're not. They don't think too highly of themselves, so it's an easy way to like feel better about them. It's the same reason why people pick on each other in school. And again, politics, yeah, power dynamics. Politics, full circle. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> no, don't apologize. No, we still love you, De- Delivery Boy Roy. We still love you. Don't. Yeah, of course we love. Around. you. We're, hey, I know hey, you're, you're probably, probably just joking around anyway. Continue sharing your, your opinion. Like, I, I love it. There we go. See? He has a, yeah. They have a really to. cheery outlook. Okay. All right. All right. We Hey, I mean, we love you. You're not a doomer. Okay. Even if even if you were a doomer, we still love you. Okay. Exactly. I love doomers. <laughs> and boomers. Um, okay. Hey, take it easy. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's, uh, you, you crossed the line there. <laughs> uh, I think it's your turn. Okay. All right? Uh, yes. Yes. Correct. Okay, so I have a question for you, Mr. Beat. Is there such thing as a good president? And if so, how is that measured? Oh my gosh. This is an upcoming video. How oh, did you really? do this? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not coming out till the summer, though, because I was wanting to release it closer to the election. Uh, but yeah, what a great I'm question. I'm in your mind. <laughs> well, and I honestly don't know the full answer to that. Um, I did re- recently release a video about like what does the president actually do? Because so many people don't really think about th- what the job entails. Like, what would you say yeah. if you were just to tell anyone like what you think the president does? Like, how would you describe their job? <laughs> they read scripts that people write for them. <laughs> you should, yeah, it's all about speech. Hey. That's a big part of it is like communication. And we don't bring this up enough. I don't think, I mean, oh, we kind of do in a superficial way. Like if the president, um, like I remember when I was uh, younger, Bushisms, you know, like George W. Bush would say something wacky and everybody would make fun of him. And, uh, you know, obviously with Donald Trump and Joe Biden, it's been like a whole bag of goodies, like, cause they, uh, they'll say crazy yeah. things. But really with Biden, a lot of times it's like, I think he just messes up what he's trying to say. And he's not the most charismatic either. Uh, But yeah, that's a big part of the job because you have a a policy, an agenda that you're trying to communicate to the American people. And I think uh, that's a huge part of the job. Also, communication with other world leaders, whoops, Uh, with, you know, diplomacy and making sure that (laughs) we're getting along with other countries. So I don't think it's brought up actually enough, but yeah, as far as like you learned in elementary school or not elementary school, maybe middle school or high school, the, how a bill becomes a law, they sign the bill or they veto it. I mean, that's another part of it too. The, so, um, did you learn that? (laughs) As I think about it deeper, like in a more serious answer, I feel like the true answer is the job of a president is to hire the right people and put them in the right places. That's also a big part of it. Yeah. The administrative. Um, that's why I think so. We, it's hard to like have a president that it fits all of the um, the criteria as far as good in every aspect. But I would say, yeah, they, they are first and foremost are good at communicating. They are inspirational. They can convince people, uh, including lawmakers. If they want a law passed, they can convince them like Abraham Lincoln convincing uh, members of Congress to pass this to ratify the 13th amendment uh, or whether it be Lyndon Johnson, who was really good at um, drumming up support for, you know, uh, Medicare for crying out loud, um, which was very controversial back then in in the 1960s. Um, Yeah. I have a question, Mr. Beat, Mr. Beat. Yeah. Yeah. What, what does convincing lawmakers mean? Like why do lawmakers need convincing? 
because they're the ones who passed the laws. Like the 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 members of the Congress, like a lot of people, are like oh the president, why can't they just like get this law passed? Well, it's, sometimes it's because members of Congress just don't like the president. You know, we don't think about that enough. That you you it won't the bill won't even get to your to the president's desk if because the in Congress they have limited time. And there's only so many bills they can even consider. So if a president really wants a law passed, you know, they can schmooze their way through the halls of Congress uh, talking to representatives and senators, you know, uh, which is what, I mean, that's a big part of it too. So also the State of the Union is an example of uh, communicating mostly to the American people uh, going on television, as they call it, or... Um, Trump was really good with the internet, actually. People don't give him credit for that, but uh, Franklin Roosevelt was good with the radio, you know, talking directly to the people. <laughs> the radio. Um, <laughs> and then the other part of making a good president is uh, being decisive, uh, pragmatic. This is just my opinion, so I should really stress that because people will disagree with me. But uh, I think having good moral judgment, um, trying to do whatever you can to um, save the most lives, make the most people happy, uh, make the most people safe, and not just Americans, but humans, um, which some people might disagree with me on that. They might say, <laughs> oh no, American, Americans, have, <laughs> Americans are more human than other humans, come on. Uh, <laughs> and then another part of being a good president is like you, you mentioned this, which is Kudos to you, because a lot of folks don't think about this. But yeah, picking the right people around you, your cabinet um, advisory positions, like assembling a team that can really um, carry out the laws as they're, as they're supposed to be carried out. Um, and also like following through with carrying out the laws, because that's the primary job really more than anything is carrying out um, laws that are already passed. So um so I get why there's a lot of criticism of the president if there's chaos at the border. That, that makes perfect sense because, I mean, even if it's just perceived chaos, again, that goes back to communication. I, I think a lot of the, what's happening at the border with Mexico right now is manufactured by the media, but it doesn't matter because you, the uh, the president needs to capture the message and say, hey, things are fine. Because most people like sitting in their homes right now, it's not like they're looking in their backyards or in the in the hallway and they see like migrants running down the hallways most people are not affected by the uh, immigration crisis <laughs> migrant cri crisis whatever and it's really called a crisis because the media says that but capturing the narrative saying everything's fine and that's why just even, i know it sounds silly but just going to the border just like just physically being there that was a big deal that was uh when the president went to meet with the union workers when they went on strike the auto workers um, that was a big deal too. He was, the, Biden was the first president, I think, to ever do that. And that was, it sends a signal. So, uh, these things do matter, um, as superficial as they may sound. I'm starting to ramble though. I'm sorry. I, it was all interesting. I actually, uh, created a new question that I will ask sometime down the line. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you can, you can ask it up. That's fine. Follow up question. Now. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, uh, I'll add it to the queue. I have other questions as well. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, well, speaking of laws, uh, my next question, this is also related to the first question I asked, but um, should there, maybe I already know the answer, actually. Should there be laws passed um, to at least regulate artificial intelligence? Um, and if not, I guess, why, why can't we even at least regulate it? Can't you see anything going wrong? I'm all down for regulation. I just, I think that AI, it's so early in this stage that like, we need to be more specific when we say stuff like this, like just a basket all regulation. Like, what does that, what does that really mean? You know? Um, but if, if I hear like very specific regulations, I might be on board with them depending on what it is. Okay. So say in terms of like, cause I always think about um, human capital. So the like the fact that mm -hmm. if we put in the energy to doing some, to producing something that benefits our, our everyone around us um, or society at large, we should be 
compensated, you know, like, so if, if there is little human input, I guess, like, but there's still somebody getting financial reward, would you be down with like, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it, an AI tax of some sort? <laughs> AI tax? Yeah. Um, do you but mind you walking me through? Well, I, I just thought of this, like, literally uh, the other day when I was thinking up questions for you, but you know, if somebody does like make thousands of dollars a month on a YouTube channel, that's completely AI and um, they really don't put much, like maybe they do like uh, one to two hours a month of work. Let's say it's that advanced. Um, should they, I feel like others that will be hurt by that. Like it's, it is, it is a zero sum game. So if it's a zero sum game, maybe they should be taxed or something. I don't know. Maybe I could be wrong. I mean, look, I, I get where you're coming from. Uh, it's hard for me to really imagine this because like this is a potential future, but it's like very far down the future. I mean, down the line. You um, think? Is it really yeah. that far? You said an hour or two to produce something. I mean, I looking at what's what came out with the, the uh, what was it? Sora came out with. And that was like within one year they go from the um, uh, Will Smith eating the spaghetti. Remember that that yeah. video to what Sor Sora released uh, just a couple weeks ago or a few weeks ago, where it looked like they were in. You know, I, I probably should pull this up, but like they looked like they were in California Gold Rush era, eighteen forty eight. Um, <laughs> do you, do you play video games at all? I used to. I don't really anymore. Okay. Are you familiar with uh, Battlefield? Um, shucks. Battlefield. Ha! Ah, what is the latest one? Give me one second. Look it up. Okay. I'm going, okay, some, go I'm going somewhere with this. While you're doing that, I'm going to share the what I was talking about. Uh, Battlefield 2042. Are you familiar with this game at all? I, I think I've heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Battlefield 2042 is a game that graphically looks amazing it looks next generation etc etc says down the line in fact a better a better example is cyberpunk I, have you heard of cyberpunk 2077 yes definitely okay. cyberpunk 2077 is a game that looks phenomenal right render wise etc etc right so you can make all these various trailers that you want to advertise the game right how beautiful it looks right but then when you buy it especially at launch mm -hmm. it is a piece of crap right okay so the point that I'm getting at here is that like Sora can look beautiful all it wants. It can look realistic all it wants. It still needs use cases, right? It needs what? It needs use cases. It needs it needs like someone who wants to take Sora and use it for production. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. And so I think that like this cycle that we are going through with Sora has been done time and time and time again. I remember back when the right. first dolly had dropped and everyone's like oh my god this is the end of creation all photographers are done that was what five six years ago <laughs> like photographers are fine they're fine and sora is no different like sure we are amazed by these cherry pick examples that we've been shown but even some of the cherry pick examples there's a clip of a, of a like dogs in the snow and the physics is just all off you're right. not going to throw that in a Hollywood movie with the fit. Like, it's going to be so distracting to the viewers, right? And so, like, I think that these are really cool tools. Don't get me wrong. And I think that it, it has its place, but I, I just don't see it for production. Like, I think it can be great to create some memes on YouTube, Reels, whatever, TikTok. But for actual production, I, I just don't see it. Because solving the problem of, like, making sure physics is accurate is far more difficult than solving realistic looking uh, photo. If this makes sense. Yeah, it does. I, but you're talking that you keep talking about now though. And I'm thinking about, because the, the prog, I, I said we go from Will Smith eating um, spaghetti and I should probably put that on the screen as well. Um, and, and, and we go to the videos they just released and the, um, the jump and, um, it's just amazing how far they've come in short, 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 short I'm sorry. That, this is, I need, I need to mute this. This is the Will Smith one. This was like, this wasn't uh, much longer than um, a year ago. And, um, you know, this is, 
what AI came up with. Uh, I don't know if it was Sora or something else. And then uh, we go to this, like literally a year later, and obviously there are still issues with it. But I guess to me, um, the progress is is happening so rapidly that I feel like we probably um, should start thinking about this, like even getting better exponentially. And and if that's the case, then yeah, you, you will be just able to click a button and it's done. And somebody is producing something that can profit pretty easily. Um, does that change your mind? Like, can I can I ask you a question? Uh, of course, this is ten questions. So, okay, so <laughs> in this example that you're showing, the prompt says a stylish woman walks down Tokyo Street. Blah blah blah. Right. Uh -huh. My question for you is, how many times do you think they had to type that in to get output like this? Oh, I don't know. What, what do you think? Uh, it wasn't one. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I'll these are their one. best examples. I get it. I get they they still have a long ways to go. Uh, yes. And the but, only point that I'm really trying to drive here is that, like, I, I think it's really easy for us to be impressed by the quality element of video that AI can generate, right? But video is so much more than just quality, right? You can grab a camera from the 70s and create a masterpiece on, on like, that bad quality. Why? Because quality isn't the only important aspect to video, to okay. film, to movie, right? It's... Yes, the quality is good here, but everything else surrounding it still needs a lot of work. To teach an AI how to be physically accurate is not a walk in the park. Not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying it's impossible, but based on the research, the trajectory it's been on, it, we're still far ways off from getting AI to learn these aspects of video, film, et cetera, et cetera. How do you know we're far ways off? You just look at the trajectory. So if you go back to, so the, the AI generated video has been around for a while, right? The quality now is very impressive, but it's been around for a while. And okay, I, I think that this is a really good cherry pick example. The jury's still be, still out. We have to wait until they drop Sora to really see like how good or bad it is. Like maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it could be amazingly mind blowing. I doubt it. Highly doubt it. Based on some of the cherry pick examples they showed. But my prediction, my guess is going to be that to get something like this, you're going to have to click at least at least like 20 times to get something like this, right? And they have already came out and stated that this stuff is not cheap to generate. So right, right. you're looking at, I don't know how much it costs, but let's say it costs it takes you 20 clicks to get something of this quality. And let's say every single click costs you $2, right? Now you're looking at, what is that, 40? You're looking at $40 just to get like a five second clip. You know, how right. much clips do you need for, like it just, at some point just becomes like not feasible to create content like this. But again, I think that there is a potential future where we get to the point where it is possible to do something like that. But I think we're still. I should just graph it out. I should make a video and just graph out like you the, should. The, the delta of all the, the various elements that it takes to create video, because physics has made such little progress over the years, which is ah. incredibly important. You, like if you watch if you watch The Matrix, right, you watch The Matrix and then you see Neil jump in the air, right? Yeah. But then he like grows a third leg and then it snaps back into two legs. You're, you would be so distracted by that. You'd be confused. And if that happens over and over and over again, what you have come to learn, what like media is or what, what film is, would completely fundamentally change. Yeah, I, I'm, I should make a video on it. I think yeah, that definitely. About isn't. Uh, by the way, this person I think is right. He said, uh, they said, or she said, it seems the cyberpunk analogy went right over his head. I think. Do they mean that like, because I am looking into it too much in terms of I'm focusing too much on the superficiality of it. Like I'm just looking at the very tip of the iceberg and ignoring the vastness underneath. Is that really what the cyberpunk analogy was about? Because um, I feel like an idiot right I, now, by the way. I, 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 I want to use nice words. Uh. Basically, what I was saying with the cyberpunk analogy, right? So you take cyberpunk and you take Minecraft. Okay. Right? You you will if you just take the marketing materials of both games, you will create a far more appealing, appetizing marketing campaign for Cyberpunk 2077 than you will for Minecraft, right? But 
Minecraft and Cyberpunk are more than just a marketing campaign. They're an actual product that people actually use and play, right? So when when Cyberpunk 2077 launched, it was buggy, it was broken, you could barely even play the game, right? Despite it being beautiful. Right. But Minecraft, if you play Minecraft, it's not the prettiest game, but there's so much that you can do in Minecraft. Right, right. And right. I'm trying to I'm trying to uh correlate Sora here with Cyberpunk 2020 uh, 2077. Sure, it looks sense. beautiful, right? But when yeah. it comes to actually using it, that's where I have questions. Okay. All right. I still think we're they're going to get there. It's uh, possible. I, I never say never. But no, you've uh, you've moved me uh, in a different direction. Like you've been changing my mind on multiple things today. So congratulations. <laughs> oh, All yeah. right. I think it's your turn. Is it? Wait, is it? Wait. Yes, it's your turn. Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. Um. Okay. I have a question for you, Mr. Pete. Based on everything that you know, given, you know, global events and history, et cetera, et cetera, if you were a betting man, what would you say would be the likeliest global doomsday scenario? Oh, uh, well, it depends on the day you asked me. Like a few months ago, I was all about like, I think it, if anything, it's going to be an asteroid. And I think it's because I was watching a lot. Yeah, because I watched that Veritasium asteroid video and it was really good. And so I went down a rabbit hole watching asteroid videos. But, um, you know, what's been on my mind lately, again, is climate change. Because um, I went back and revisited predictions of like if the planet, um, you know, warmed even by one degree, there would be pretty significant changes. There's a National Geographic series, I think, that um, about 20 years ago that came out. And I, I remember being freaked out back then. This is when I didn't know much about climate change. And uh, But they said, if it's four degrees warmer, um, then it's made it seem like, oh my gosh, like our, this is a, like our species is in serious danger. And I had, had not, and I went back and revisited that stuff. And I was like thinking like, this past year, sure enough, was the hottest on record. And uh, mm. there's so many people now that are just like accepting it. <laughs> like, oh, we're already screwed. And and I think that's what's, what's really weird to me is that with climate change, even like people that used to deny it now admit that ex it exists. Like my dad is one of those people. Interesting. But now he says, oh, well, there's nothing we can do. Or like humans really... We can't. We don't. We haven't really affected it that much anyway. It wasn't really mostly because of us. Um, so there's still a little bit of denial, but I think because the world is dragging its feet so much, um, I do think that's probably going to happen. Like, I don't know. We could have evidence uh, that pr presented to us by <laughs> the folks looking at the skies um, that changes my mind. Maybe it is an asteroid. But those those are the two latest ones um, that I've been thinking about. What about you? Okay. Follow up question. Yeah. How, how do you think history would be different if Al Gore won? Oh my gosh, I get this question uh, <laughs> uh, like a lot of times on my Discord server. Well, you said uh, you said climate change, so I'm really interested to, to hear. Oh your yeah. no, definitely it would be a higher priority for sure. Like, um, yeah. I think we probably would have seen more swift action on, uh, especially because like in the in the aughts, um, the price of oil skyrocketed, and remember the reason why oil went down first was the great recession. But then after that, why the price of oil went down was fracking production um, in North America went way up because of fracking and there's issues with fracking, but overall most people are okay with it. Um, and that's kind of like also, whereas I think if it was um, we would be, we wouldn't jump into fracking as quickly. I think if there was an Al Gore president for eight years versus a George W. Bush, but honestly, I don't think the difference would be that much. Like I get a lot of crap because people say that, um, would we have gone in the Iraq war if Al Gore was president? I get so many people angry at me saying that, yeah, we would have. And, uh, and the reason why I say that is because I've studied history before. And uh, <laughs> here's something that people don't remember. They, they like to for conveniently forget this. In 2003, um, most Americans were all about going to war in Iraq. Most Americans, were, even if they didn't find weapons of mass destruction, they didn't like Saddam Hussein. They, fresh in their memories, they were like thinking about the Persian Gulf War. Oh, that was easy. We just went in for a few months. 
and easily defeated Iraq. We can do it again. It'll be a, sh a short thing. It wasn't until much later, 2005, 2006, 2007, when all of a sudden you saw this sweeping change and people became anti-war. We think of those anti-war protests because, oh, well, Michael Moore was loud at, at the Oscars or the you know people in France, you know, freedom fries, all this crap. But no, the majority of Americans, including the majority of Congress, many, many Democrats were yeah. for the Iraq war. And Bill Clinton himself was regularly bombing uh, <laughs> Iraq throughout his presidency. So the people, uh, sorry, I'm kind of like getting fired up, but I get a lot of crap for that saying that, oh, the Iraq war wouldn't have happened if Al Gore was in there. No, it would have, in my opinion. Now, I, would he have withdrawn the troops sooner? I probably think so. It would have been shorter but I think it still would have happened. Well, I, have a, I want to backtrack real quick with uh, Al Gore becoming president. If it, like, let's say that this happened, you don't think that climate change would be, or, or yeah, climate change would be like more politicized. Oh, it definitely would. Yeah. I'm just saying like, and I know this also kind of sounds cynical, but really the most important thing in not just American society, but worldwide is GDP going up. And we don't like to admit it, but uh, as long because like what happens if if people aren't making money, then that's when we turn to uh, fascism, demagogues, revolution, instability of society. So as long as like people are the wages are sneaking up, and so that's the most important thing, whether politicians say it uh, out loud or not. Um, a lot of times it's not politically appropriate for them to say because people don't think it, that's not center of mind. But I. Uh, I also got in a lot of trouble for saying this too online. I said, hey, uh, yeah, the quickest way to learn anything is to learn history, but the quickest way to learn history is to learn economics. I got so <laughs> much crap for saying that. But the, the thing is, I think the reason why I got so much crap is that I think I truly believe that people don't really understand what economics is. It's just scarcity. The study of how we make choices based off scarcity. Everything runs out. You stop just automatically thinking it's about money. If people are desperate, they that like if they can't support themselves or their family, then everything else doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> and that's why yeah. also that's that's a good way to predict uh, who's going to win the presidency. Like this in November, uh, I, I do this. Uh, I did this. Who you got? Who you got? Tell me. Who you well, got? No, you, you have to wait. You have to wait till right before the election. But all you got to do is look at the economic data. So there's a uh, the uh, misery index, as they call it. So it's basically it measures uh, inflation and the unemployment rate, and it just adds them up. And if it got, if it goes down, if the unemployment rate goes down from the previous year, inflation goes down from the previous year, then whoever the incumbent is will get reelected. Mm. Um, <laughs> and if it's gone up, then the challenger will get elected. So interesting. The other weird thing is that we have two incumbents this year, so that kind of throws a wrench into some of it. So it will be interesting. Yeah, because oh right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trump, yeah. So yeah, it's just oh, so you think Trump's going all the way. Uh well, it's too early to say. You have to you, wait. Well, you already said two incumbents. You already <laughs> Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, no, no. I I will do a, a live stream probably to predict right before the uh the presidency because I you know you just look at the economic data is all you do, but the latest data that you have. <clears throat> sure. So now I'm gonna sound like an idiot when I get it wrong. <laughs> Hey, that's part of that's part of the internet, you know. You just gotta shake it off and keep walking. Yeah, yeah. I I say I'm wrong all the time, and maybe that's my problem. I am an idiot. Okay. On that note, uh, let's see here. Oh yeah. So this is kind of related to the election. So, um, you know, we live in a really fragmented society um, where we kind of all retreat to. Uh, our little corners of the internet, you know, we, we have our echo chambers or we have our, we'll hang out in our discord servers or yeah. work groups. And, you know, we rarely kind of step out into a, a space where we've encountered people that disagree with us or are watching different shows than us. Or Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. 100%. Okay. So <laughs> related to that, um, do you think that's more of a good thing or more of a bad thing and why? Man, oh man, what a great question. <laughs> hmm, I, I'm at to work this out like in real time. Sure, I, I believe it's both good and bad. I think it's good in the sense that, like, 
we have more avenues to express ourselves and be who we truly want to be, right? But I think it's bad in the sense that, like, now we have less in common with each other. Um, and and that just creates, like, so much vitriol when you have, like, the slightest opposition from someone. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, back, back, you know, when I was growing up, you know, we didn't have... The internet wasn't as per pervasive as it was today, right? So there were some... Uh, there were some... Um, uh, what I'm trying to say. There, let me rephrase it. You had insurance that like people were watching one of a few buckets, right? Or consuming one of a few buckets, right? So like cable television, there's only so many channels, right? So at some point you had some crossover with someone because you mm -hmm. watched the latest Cartoon Network show or the HBO thing, right? But nowadays, as you said, the discords and the various YouTube and what there's so many like small community, small bubbles that you can just stay in there for, for 10, 20, 30 years and not understand or not have any idea what other bubbles are cultivating and thought and et cetera, et cetera. And I think that it can create really vitriolic scenarios when these two bubbles clash and they don't like each other and they, don't, they can't find that common ground. And usually th that happens in one place like Twitter. <laughs> yeah. And Twitter is usually the boiling point, you know, or any social media, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so it's like I don't know. It's 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 double edged sword. It's like I, I do like that people, and especially kids nowadays, have like more places to really express themselves and be themselves, you know, and they don't have to like stay in the closet for whatever metaphor you might see that as, right? Um, but at the same time, thing can get a little, you know, a little dangerous in terms of you know stale thought, in in bubbles, you know. Yeah, I go back and forth as well. That's why I asked it because I was like. I don't know. Lately, I've seen more negative um, commentary on it. That, but at the same time, like I feel a lot of people meet people they never would have met otherwise. Yeah. Like uh, friendships have been made on my Discord server, and I know for a fact that some of these friendships were made despite the fact that uh, they were from different countries or they had different religions um, or really even just different values in general. Which we a lot a lot of times that's what it comes down to values, which it's also weird to say because most values overlap. Most humans have the same values. Um, so, but at the same time, yeah, like the, a lot of the, uh, it's weird because you will hear somebody on uh, like, uh, will not really hear them. You'll see it on social media. Someone talking trash about immigrants. I brought this the second time I brought up this example, but, but then that same person met somebody on an online forum. That's an immigrant. But well, no, they're different, you know. Right. Heck, they even meet them at, in real life, too. That's still the same thing. Like, uh, I just feel we're not really as divided as I think that um, these public forum, like social media makes us seem like we are, because otherwise we would see it carry over to the, the real world. Mm -hmm. We would see it at the gym, at the grocery store, at uh, these public spaces where we still do meet, you know. We still interact, and you just don't see it that much. So yeah. that's... I think it, I tend to be more positive than uh, I think it's more of a positive than negative, but still I go back and forth as well. Yeah. So what's interesting, I do agree with you. I do definitely agree with you, but I feel now we're kind of flipped in terms of like the trajectory of things, right? How you're arguing like Sora's here now, but in the future, right? Oh. That's kind of where I'm at with the whole internet. The thing. Like, yeah, we're here now. It's not really spilling over, but in the future though, right? Which is where my concern comes from. Um, I think about when I was a kid, I, I'm so old. I, I'm so old. I say that line now too often. Um, <laughs> when I was a kid, we, you didn't have a choice. Like you're forced to talk to someone who didn't share the same values with you. Like you're forced to talk to them. You're forced to get along with them. You're forced to learn what they value. Right. And that influenced who you were as a person. And I, I would argue maybe more of a more compassionate person. Right. But nowadays, you know, entropy is so pervasive, right? Like you, you have to give something to get something, right? And what we're what we're giving is that when it comes to like these online communities, right? To 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 get the 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 meeting someone like you that shares the same values like you, right? You can go to you can go to class and not say a word the entire semester, but it's the second you get back home, you're in the Discord talking to people who have the same thoughts as you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of rambling right now, but no, no, you, 
I like this ramble. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I just think but that. Not, but I think that what's missing from the online, uh, you can tell like people, the people that spend all day online, yeah, it's not healthy. It, there's lots of research to back this up, and people also yearn to interact with others. In, in fact, I, I would argue that Gen Z is is kind of reversing the trend that millennials kind of started. Like they are more and more abandoning social media and they are more and more to say, hey, let's meet up. And like even like the the invention of the smartphone, you could say, was a positive in terms of like getting people um, to meet more in real life or GPS, because you know, when you're able to have internet anywhere, you're, there's more opportunities to have, you know, real life interactions and touch grass. Sorry, I said it. Uh, does that, I mean, so I guess that's another positive development that, but you're, you're saying like, so how is this going to get worse? How do you yeah. see it get, getting worse? So, so a couple points. So the first point is, is that th I think there's objectively two different worlds that we currently live in, right? We have the real world, right? Go out with you, buy groceries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? I don't care what anyone says, the entirety of the internet is the metaverse. That is the metaverse, right? Hmm. And I, a, a growing concern that I have is that a lot of people are, I, I would need to like really get some real data on this, but my hunch is that a lot of people are increasingly taking actions in the real world to better their metaverse like profile right oh interesting so it's like you go to a concert right and you have your phone out the entire time why because you need to post it on instagram you need to post it on blah, 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 right you go to disneyland and you're taking seventy thousand photos why because you need to put you need to prove that you were at disneyland in the metaverse right and this is this is a this is a trend that I have a hunch has been getting more increasingly, increasingly more and more and more. And my fear is that like it gets to a point where like this is just so pervasive in every human across the world, right? We're trying to connect more countries to the internet. Elon Musk has the the space link or whatever it's called, neural uh, whatever. Neuralink. What the, no, no, yeah. the space one. What's the space one? Oh, and the internet from satellite. Yeah, uh, he's trying to do that. Starlink, so we can connect more countries to the internet, right? And, yeah. and my fear is that, like, it's going to get to a point where, like, over by fifty percent of humans on Earth care about their metaverse profile more than their real world profile, right? Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, but at the moment, it's not there yet, right? I think that, like, us who are on the internet a lot, it, it may seem that way, but I feel like you just disconnect from the internet and just go out in the world like there's a lot of people who are like don't give a shit about uh, excuse me don't care about the internet um at all yeah but it's now i see trend that that fears me that scares me man i also though maybe maybe we're online too much because i mean we do this for a living or we engage with this because we kind of that's just what we do but yeah like i think about uh there's a lot i even folks my age and i know some that are younger than me that are just not you know terminally online like yeah. they uh they disconnect and you know it's not a big deal they use it when they need to um but yeah i i do think it's uh see we see this with every generation too like i, I feel like millennials kind of we had bad timing with a lot of things but in particular with social media but also older generations i mean i think some of the most addicted people to social media right now are actually in their fifties, sixties, seventies, even. And, um, you know, they just can't stop scrolling all day. Uh, this is definitely a serious problem, but I guess like younger people do learn from the mistakes of the grownups. And I do, I'm starting to, and working with, uh, younger people, uh, being a teacher, I started to see this too. I'm like, you know, they, they don't engage with the internet like like uh, older people do and mm -hmm. it's uh like to me the vibe i got was they were on mostly tiktok and snapchat this i mean i left teaching in 2021 but i still you know i interact with on on the discord server i kind of see the trends with younger folks i'm trying not to be too out of touch with younger folks and yeah the trend seems to be more like it's a medium with the end goal of meeting someone in, 
and person because let's be honest here like we all just want to another warm body another bag of organs and bones to hook up with you know <laughs> sure of course yeah i mean we don't want to be lonely and yeah. it you can't satisfy like i know there's the one of my favorite movies is her i'm, I'm assuming you've seen her uh starring uh joaquin phoenix and uh spike jones made it but yeah it's uh it's obviously more relevant today than ever before if you haven't seen it watch her um it's just called eight her h-e-r anyway but yeah like even in the lesson i don't want to spoil it but the lesson in that movie is that you know um you still need a human you still need other humans um that it can never be replaced entirely um maybe it can for temporarily and so i feel like that's why i still have that glimmer of hope that there's going to be a lot of folks younger folks in particular that abandon um you know the digital world <laughs> or not completely abandon it but you know really restricted in their lives because for yeah. their, their own mental health i listen this is a great conversation we can probably talk about this for the entirety of the cast but <laughs> i think that like i agree with you or I, I I can't say I agree with that. I don't I don't know the data, but it that sounds right. right. That sounds right. Um I however it doesn't necessarily like counter the point that I'm trying to make in the sense that like the internet is still the metaverse is still a tool that is used to foster these real world connections, right? And and the 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 real point that I'm trying to drive here is that like there is a huge part of my identity that comes from being forced to hang out with people that I, if I had the option today, I probably never would have done. Right. Um, I don't know the, the proper term for these type of men uh, that like date women really sleazy. They call F boys. I, F boys is appropriate. So when I was younger, I was forced to hang out with F boys just because like I had no other option, right? Like the internet wasn't as pervasive, but my experiences of learning how they think, how they operate, how they move is a huge part of my identity, right? And it's giving me a perspective on the world, right? To the point where like, I can hear a woman talk about some experience that she had in dating and understand like what is happening on the other side, right? It gives me a, a fresh perspective. And I think that like using the metaverse as, as, a, as, a, uh, as a point to connect people in the real world, I think it kind of takes away from that. Because if I had the option, I can say, no, I don't want to hang out with this person. I'm going to use the internet to find people that are like me, right? But now I'm losing out on this perspective. I'm losing out on this, uh, this information, on this part of my identity of who I am today. I see, and yeah, yeah it, it's, it, it's just, you know, as it gets more pervasive, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I don't know. They're just thoughts. Okay. This has gotten so philosophical. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> all right I, I forgot whose turn it was is it my uh it's my turn okay uh okay so many questions okay i want to ask you something controversial all right yeah coming at you so it. when i was in high school i was taught that native americans were destined by god to turn over the country by way of manifest destiny now why did I have to leave high school and learn this outside of high school? What, what the actual truth was. Your teacher actually taught you that <laughs> this was in the, the history books, like texts oh, written on the history books. Well, yeah. I mean, most history textbooks for the longest time up until really the, with, and not until the last 20 years um, were produced for either a Texas or California um, audience. So the more left-leaning textbooks were like Howard's end type were, Usually California, but not necessarily. Usually they had more of a right leaning bent um, just because, you know, uh, you're trying to reach. You don't want to shake things up too much. And you're trying to sell textbooks. You're trying to make money. And there's only a handful of textbook companies that could afford to do that. This is before the Internet changed things, of course. So, yeah, maybe that's not too far fetched because I was I, I was taught the lost cause uh, to a certain extent when it comes to the, um, you know, reconstruction, the Civil War. And I it took me going to college to like be deprogrammed from that. And I, you know, but yeah, like uh, as far as manifest destiny, um, I didn't really, I think what really helped me was I 
I learned early on about um, the Trail of Tears. That was really something that really stuck out in my mind. Like, holy crap, this. And we were taught that. And at, I was taught that as young as seventh grade. And and then I started to kind of research on my own. But yeah, no, that's really disturbing how, um, I mean, still to this day, people have misconceptions about Native Americans. And I think the the thing that really, I think we can't even wrap our heads around is how some historians estimate as many as 90, maybe even 95% of all Native Americans died from disease. Yeah, before Europeans even arrived because disease traveled faster than the actual Europeans did back then. Um, and so, you know, Europeans would come across villages where it looked like the apocalypse. They, every, there was, they would come up like... Once thriving villages um, that everyone was dead, and uh, and so so much of that history isn't even written down to begin with, and so that's yeah. already. And so I feel like we're when we teach history, we're just kind of like a lot of times we're just giving token examples because oh, we know more about the Lakota, for example, and so we can we can make movies like Dances with Wolves about the Lakota because we actually have more to work with because there was, you know, we have photographs of the Lakota when they were still uh, nomadic and all this, um, you know, Geronimo, one of the last uh, Native Americans to resist being put on a reservation, the uh, Apache. Um, so there's lots of information about certain nations, tribes, but then the vast majority of them, we just don't have the information. And I feel like that's what hurts us more than anything, learning about um, the truth about these nations is that uh, the written language, um, or that we don't have written records of a, a lot of us just like, you know, the, the mound cities that, um, uh, the look, the, Co uh, oh my gosh, the, uh, Cahokia mounds, uh, near the Mississippi river. There is so much we don't know about these places. Uh, if you actually like start to learn about it, you're just like, wait a second, this is all speculation and conjecture. We we don't even, so, uh, it's almost like, yeah, like, you know, archeologists trying to figure out, um, mm. folks from the <laughs> stone ages. And so I, I, I wish we had more information and that's a big reason why that, but I guess all we can do now is we can just do our best to learn. And, um, I think movies have been really helpful. Like shout out to, uh, uh, killers of the flower moon. Have you seen that movie? It's on uh, Apple TV really good. It's the Scorsese movie that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is the star in it. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, it's about the Osage, um, in, uh, Oklahoma. They, uh, there were a series of murders in the 1920s, uh, that happened. Uh, local Oklahoman people were just straight up murdering the, the Osage for, um, their oil wealth. Pretty messed up. Nobody knew about it. It's just like with the, the Tulsa, uh, uh, riots like I know about that decades, one. It was yeah. Well, now we all know about it, but for decades, like yeah, they just sure. no one brought it up, and so it is amazing to me how. And of course, you're going to get people to say, "Oh, you're just teaching that because you you're trying to make history woke." Okay, sure. Like they need to know the truth. Like yeah. uh, it's just <laughs> it just drives me nuts when because a lot of times this these stories are covered up because it makes a certain group look bad. They're so afraid. It's pride. Like, I don't want my ancestors to look bad. Well, here's a newsflash. All of our ancestors were bad, okay? And then one day, somebody's going to look back on us, and they're going to think we were all horrible people, too. <laughs> so just, just accept it. We we need to learn from our mistakes. You got me on these. You're here. <laughs> You're here. Hey, listen. <laughs> just a sign of a good question, huh? <laughs> it is. Good, great question. All right. Um, if you're just now joining us, uh, thank. Oh, hey, how you doing, Malo Funk Shun Eight Oh Eight? I uh, representing Hawaii. Thank you Hawaii. for joining us, and thanks for the super chat. Okay, my turn. I, I talk too much. I'm sorry. Okay, we're gonna go back to AI. Is that okay? I AI love it. Questions? Yeah. Okay. Jeez. That's all I think about. Um, so yeah, this is more broad question. Like, how do you, you see like generative artificial intelligence, um, changing society long-term? Uh, I know that's an open-ended, pretty open-ended, but how, how do you think it's going to change society broadly? 
so I honestly think we need to step away from generative a bit. If I'm being completely honest, I think the generative text is really good and is going to be is fundamentally going to change society from this point on. But I'm not too convinced that the image and video stuff is going to do too much. Like, ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Like, because the text with, with generative text, you can you can it's essentially giving data a voice, right? Which is un, unheard of, like historically, right? And in that context, it's very valuable. You could take any data set that you want and then have it generate text to give it a voice, essentially, right? But then when you, when you look at photo, there aren't too many use cases on what you can do with photo, right? Like you and I, you want to take a selfie together right now using AI? Like, do you want, like, is that something you really want to do? I, I don't really care for something like that. Maybe the next generation will. Um, do you do you want to use video to get a shot of you driving your car holding a pizza? Like, wh what are the use cases for these things? You know, and I think that there is a place for them. I just don't think that is nowhere near the value that generative text adds, right? Mm. Um, and so I think that in terms of like what we've have been doing for generative, I think we should step away from that stuff. I think there's still some place for generative, like. You can create like generative models for vehicles, you know, that Toyota might use, whatever the case may be in that sense. But those are very specific use cases. Um, I think really we should really get more into like classification. I think we should go harder on classification, AI, and um, what's the other one? Could you uh, explain the difference for um, folks like me who? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> I apologize. No, it's okay. Uh, so, so generative is literally like you have a like you have a model that's learned from some data, and it's trying to generate like general patterns that it's learned within the model, right? Right. And oftentimes, nine nine times out of ten, when you when you examine like the use case for this, it's often very specific to like some industry or some company. It's very rarely like a a a value add to all of humanity. Except for text. Text is very, very, very valuable. A very huge valuable add to humanity, right? I can't think of many others beyond that. But when it comes to classification, this is how we can really uh, benefit humanity in, in making things more personalized, right? So if we get an AI that can classify, like, for example, I'm in my office right now, and it'd be great to know, like, what level of messy is my office, Right. And maybe I can take action on that. So it will classify all the objects, the way it's spread out, like what level of messy it is. And then maybe you can inject more. Like what should I clean that would make me feel more happier, right? And it would have this data to know that, right? And it's just small personal tweaks that I think like more innovation and in classification can, add, can have a more uh, greater value add to the average human. So it's more like... That, that, that's probably a bad example. I need to think deeper because <laughs> it's been a minute, but... Um, but it's more qualitative is what you're saying, like versus um, just data driven or it's more uh, kind of reacting to itself. Or is that am I I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this? Um, yeah. Admittedly, that was a bad example. Um, OK, here's here's maybe a better example. OK. OK. You. Oh, God, <laughs> we're going there. OK. <laughs> You you have all the things that you have to do to make a YouTube video, right? To run your YouTube business, et cetera, et cetera, right? All the things that you have to do at some point need to be classified, right? And at the moment, if you need help classifying certain things, like uh, how much more footage you have to shoot, right? Uh, what is potentially like the best footage to slot in here, right? These all need classifications, right? And mm -hmm. if, if you needed help with that today, you would hire a human. <laughs> you would literally hire like an assistant, you'd hire a producer, you'd hire a designer, you'd hire someone to, to help you with that, right? But with the advent of improving AI classification, it would be able to look at the data that you have and be able to classify like what best fits in here. How it would have data from a bunch of YouTube videos and it would know like what the best performing ones were. And it'd be like, okay, 
you're you're missing you need a visual here mr beat based on all the hundred million youtube videos that i've watched i'm classifying that this right here this will be the best for you to put here right and then you as a human you would then go and input you know the footage I, these are really bad examples i no. let me get back to you on like an actual really good example but that's a better example i think that that helped okay. uh this person i I don't know if I understand their question, but is the other one localization pointing out where stuff is or auto browsing for disabled, for example, um, versus, I mean, uh, so you're talking, it's more pointing out where stuff is localization, I guess is the key word. There's like, is generative more like, um, it's uh, kind of tied to something more specific. And it can't like, cry, like leave a linear path. Is that what the difference is? <laughs> yeah, I apologize. I should, I should definitely uh, work on. I'm giving you future, future video ideas. That's what yeah. I'm doing right now. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Uh, okay, let me try one more time. I think the the biggest difference, just to put it bluntly, is that quite literally, like generate versus classify, right? If I ask you, Mr. Beat, what would you like for me to generate for you? I think you would have a lot less examples on something that would be actually useful for, for me to generate for you, right? Do you want me to generate you a Beavis and Butthead doll, right? Do you want me to generate you a guitar? Do you want me to generate you a YouTube plaque, right? In terms of serving the average human, generating something, I think has far less value and less text than classifying something. Okay. Right? okay. So if I, so like, for example, you have your guitar behind you, perhaps, you know, the exact make and model, perhaps, you know, you know, what strings is, is the, um, the quality of the strings and et cetera, et cetera. But say that you didn't, right. Mm -hmm. And say I had an AI that could take your guitar and pointed at it and tell you, hey, your third string is at 20% durability. Maybe you want to replace it soon, right? This yeah. is a value add to your life versus generating you a guitar, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's more, so I just reversed it actually. Classification would be more like you get exactly, specifically what you're looking for. Where generative, it's like, yeah, in the name, you're gonna get something resembling it. Right. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. And not, and not to say that like generative technology can't continue to improve, <clears throat> where it gets closer and closer and closer to giving what you want. I just, in, in terms of like putting the two to, uh, uh, against each other, I still find classification to be far more beneficial to the average human than generation. So say we get to classification AI, where it's actually pretty impressive and and is has made huge strides. What impact is that going to have on just society in general? Is this going to solve scarcity, for example, like not completely solve it, but, you know, make it so we don't really have to work anymore or. <laughs> um, I don't think so. No, no, mm -hmm. that's not the job of classification. I have an actual, actual really good example, actually. Okay. So in, in my perfect world, I would love this classification AI, right? An AI that gets inputs to every component in my car. Oh, yeah. Every component, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's able to classify the condition of my car. It can tell me, hey, we noticed that the quality of your pistons have decreased by 3%. You might want to check this out before something serious happens soon, right? Like, that is a real-world, like, beneficial example to classification, classification AI to not only my life, but to so many people's lives versus... Hey, AI, can you generate me a photo of a car that I want to someday own? You know, what I mean? it's like the value add is just, it's just way different. And I get it. Yeah. We, we, we have, I think that like investors run the world, right? And investors have found like generative AI very sexy. And so that is what companies are incentivized to make companies that focus on generative AI. And I think okay. we've kind of fallen away from the classification AI. It's nowhere near as sexy. It is definitely done, especially with the big companies. Like, some of the stuff that we interface with today could not be YouTube algorithm is a classification AI, right? Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. But I want more like personalized classification AI that that 
can add a lot more value to an individual average human's daily life you know okay so i imagine Hopefully i eventually got there <laughs> i was struggling a bit but well i would imagine just the first thing i always think of is like as a consumer the experience ideally should be way better uh, if that's figured out like you should know exactly or you should get exactly what you want uh, as long as you're able to afford it that is <laughs> that's a right. whole nother separate conversation but yeah um i think a lot of times there's a mismatch of what we what we uh, want and need and what we actually get not necessarily always because we don't have enough money but we don't even as consumers know what we should should have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and a lot of that's because of, you know, marketing and we're, we're constantly bombarded by information and manipulated so easily. Like none of us are immune from it. We all are <laughs> constantly manipulated. Uh, so maybe that could solve that. I don't know. I'm just trying to keep a positive spin on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I just last note. When you look at like what the end, end goal is for both classification and generation, right? The end goal of generation is to be able to, I don't know, go to go to a shop, maybe even have this like thing at my house where I say, I want a car that has five windows, it has six wheels, it has an electric motor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this device will be able to literally generate me a physical car with this description, right? That is the end goal for this generative stuff, right? But we're very far away from that. Very yeah. far away from that, right? <laughs> Versus the end goal for classification, it's just it's just helping my human brain identify things that are really difficult for me to identify. You know, give me intelligent and in, uh, intuitive insights onto the various aspects of my life. What is the status of my car? What is the status of my body? What is the status of my computer? What is the status of my relationship, right? Like these things can help us understand things that are, a little potentially out of reach and difficult for us to take all this data and get a get an understanding of. Um, so that's the last yeah. thing I'll say. It's like you just you just implant it in your head like Elon Musk wants the neural link, uh -huh. and then and then it just tells you you never have to make a choice again because it automatically knows what's the right choice to you just do this. <laughs> yeah, I mean <laughs> that's kind of real, weird. but that's that's a couple generations away. That's not I'm oh, not okay. Really okay. All right, I'll let you, uh, it's your turn. Okay. <laughs> so, um, man, I have a lot of questions, but I think this is probably top of mind. I don't exactly know how to ask this question, so bear with me. But I want to know from your perspective, from your opinion, from your research, your insights, etc. How much does money, ego, influence, power, etc., poison political decisions um like like if you were to evaluate how many decisions were like made genuinely like from the passion of a political politician's heart versus like there's some poison happening here wh <laughs> what would you say that distribution would be oh yeah it's a constant struggle i do think i mean it's mostly it's mostly self-interest i hate to say it that most politicians are acting on and not just politicians anyone any member of any organization any group i feel like um now at the family level at the even at the tribe level i think it's less common so what i mean by that is like yeah uh i know for a fact i would um you know take a bullet for my family members um i wouldn't even think twice about it but uh yeah, taking a bullet for somebody I don't know. Um, uh, you know, I don't know about that. Sure. <laughs> so uh, that's maybe it. But it's in terms of like, you know, a politician, a lot of these people that go, they get into politics do start out. I would say the vast majority of them start out, you know, with they go into it because they are, feel strongly about justice. Uh, they have compassion, empathy. That's the big one, empathy. Um, because, you know, it's like it's also a weird thing too, because do you cry when you watch movies? Do you some ever... of them. Some of them. Okay, yeah, I I sometimes do, and I wonder where that comes from. And because like you you don't necessarily cry with your loved ones like that, so why is it why is it unleashed 
maybe I should be talking to my therapist about this. But, uh, <laughs> you know, like, uh, I think that also reveals something because um, that also taps into, um, you know, getting empathy for strangers, for people that you don't know. And I think it's so important for society to function. We need lots of people with empathy and positions of power. Uh, but I think that the solution is simple. It's like you just make sure that people don't have too much power. Do you make sure the people that are actually in government? Very, very simple solution. Mr. Yeah, public servant. Well, I mean, the Constitution, <laughs> like people forget the, uh, the I think the biggest um, reason why the Constitution is so brilliant, even I know, I know it needs to be amended still, it needs to be changed. But, uh, you know, it, it's there to limit government power. Um, and so there's not a whole lot in there that says what <laughs> government can do. Uh, and you, you earlier we were talking about, oh, how much should government do to regulate um, artificial intelligence? And, you know, I think most people would agree like, well, maybe not a whole lot. We, we like almost everybody likes freedom. The only time you don't like freedom is if, you know, you want security. <laughs> yeah. um, and so uh, really, that should be it. Like government's there to for public safety. And now you debate all day long about what does that mean? Public safety. But that's fine. You know. Um, so the the folks that I mean it's pretty clear the the folks that get into politics and they come out much wealthier than they were when they get in that's a red flag you know mm. um, the, the folks who you know the insider trading for example I think most Americans for example we we want a law passed to prohibit insider trading and this is but there's no incentive for anybody that's in government to to do that so why would they do that the only incentive they have is they don't want to be fired. Well, and, you know, being an incumbent is uh, a pretty sweet deal. Like incumbents almost always win elections. Once you're in power, you stay in power. And so that's why there's also this huge push right now for term limits. And what's fascinating about both those things I just said, banning insider trading, having term limits um, for members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans mostly agree on that. And so I think issues like that is what we should probably will help us kind of heal as a country as, as far as political divisions. Cause these are, these are not controversial things. Like a lot of the people that say, no, there shouldn't be term limits are the people that are part of the, they're benefiting from the system in place. And when we all know the system needs reformed. All right, I'll stop. But I can't, I cannot walk away without you give me a, a predictive distribution. I need it. Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 <laughs> glossed over that um <laughs> like a you want a number specific yeah 20 percent, 30 percent. oh um it depends on where they're at like when they first enter i would all say of history. all history all decisions oh. made through history your percentage averaging all all of them out um i would say it's still usually about oh gosh i hate this <laughs> we'll say 70 percent self-interest 30 percent um oh no, I thought you were saying 70 genuine. Oh, oh my God. I'm sorry. My heart. My heart. I was tempted to go 50 50, but I maybe I've just been too cynical lately. <laughs> Man, that sucks. My goodness. I'm sorry. I'm a bummer. No, listen, it, it, that's bummer. what you genuinely believe. Like, I, <laughs> I'd rather have the truth than you lied to me. So, Man. All right. Well, it's your go on the question. Okay. All right. Here we go. Um, it's starting to get dark. I'm going to turn the light on. Sounds good. It helps a little bit, not much. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we'll keep it with the AI theme. Nice. Uh, so how will um, AI change specifically um, what we decide to do on a daily basis? And I guess this is related to the other question too. I didn't think about this, but um and how should we, I, maybe I should reframe this because I want to make sure I got a, I got a different answer. Um, so like on a day-to-day -day basis, when we get up, um, what are we going to notice first in terms of like, I'm just trying to like predict, get you to predict the future here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what do you see? How do you see our lives specifically changing? Like most of us on a day-to-day -day level because of AI. Um. Um, well, <laughs> I know it's a big question. <laughs> Take
Take your time. Honestly, you know, I think that, it, you know, it's hard to, to make predictions, right? Especially when the state of a new industry like AI is in the state that it's in now, right? Like open AI said they need $7 trillion to enter the next phase of their AI revolution, which is like, there's only so many trillions of dollars on the planet, you know? And mm -hmm. is it really that important to d dedicate that much money to AI? You know, so I, I think that like, just based on what we currently know about artificial intelligence, I find it to be very similar to a revelation I had when I was younger. I'll never forget, mom and dad, I love you, all right? But <laughs> I remember going to my parents one day as I did as a kid and asked them for like advice on something, right? Or, or how something, I think it was more like a factual thing. Like, how does this thing work? Because I wanted to know more about it. And they told me their answer. But something had happened where I, I figured out that the answer wasn't true. And so I took the Google and Google gave me the actual true answer. Oh, snap. And from that point on, I was like, respectfully, I, I have no need to go to my parents anymore and ask them questions. I can just go to Google and get the correct answer, right? And I find that, like, with the advent of ChatGPT, it's it's very similar to that, where you now have a Google search that can give you like more personalized insights than what Google can give you, right? So it's like a, it's like a shift in our own personal like educational journey. Um, I think that's about as far as I can predict. I think that there is a bubble, AI bubble coming soon that's going to pop. I think ah. investors are going to catch on that the generative stuff isn't really doing all that much. Um, yeah, that's that's where I'm at. Yeah, you really like pushed me back from both fear and optimism I had it before talking to you today. <laughs> now I'm more like, oh, well, okay, whatever. I need to get over all this. <laughs> well, I, I do think that What's uh, something, a point I did want to bring up uh, that, um, actually, no, I'm going to hold this off as a question for you. Yeah, because I don't want to, I want to see what you say. And so I'll be my next question. So, all right. Turn on me. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, your turn. Okay. So, I have an AI question for you. Um, what are your, your fears, concerns, if any, on how AI will alter history moving forward? Oh, yeah. No, that's a big reason why I've been thinking about all this is because um, so there's a uh, a YouTuber who made a video. Um, actually, I'll, I'll show it here. The um, Carolina Pro Protsenko, I think is how you pronounce her name, but she did a video on uh, not present. No, Pro Carolina. I forgot her last name. Uh, history. Zabraska. Zabra 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 that's it. I'm going through all the Carolinas here. Um, and uh, here, I'll find the video. Hold on one second here. Okay. Ew, you know how you drink like water out of plastic and it's a dice roll? If it's like tastes nasty or not? Yeah. First one was yeah. good. Second one, so, I had, it was in the sun a little too long, I think. Makes you wonder about what is actually, in, what are we actually drinking? <laughs> <laughs> okay. The video is called, Is AI Ruining Our Perception of History? Um, I highly recommend it. And it's um, so in the video, Carolina is describing how a lot of people apparently and they tend to be older folks on Facebook. OK, I don't really get on Facebook much unless I'm promoting my videos. Um, and apparently there's a lot of people on Facebook that are sharing AI generated historical content as if it really happened. You know, they make it look like old photos or just you wow. know old facts. and then people are just believing it. And sure, a lot of these folks are, again, they they didn't grow up with the internet like you or I. Um, they right. they kind of just, uh, we, we can't- value. Yeah, we, maybe, maybe they don't really believe it. They're just kind of going along with it, ha ha. But I think a lot of these people are believing it. And so that there is a concern that, um, you know, history is going to be threatened because- we forget so easily. Uh, we forget stuff that happened yesterday. How can we remember what happened a hundred years ago accurately? 
And then there's only so much we can remember. So how can, I mean, <clears throat> what if all of these algorithms are suggesting false information um, and that's what sticks to the internet? Like that's what's left behind. And, you know, like I, I do my best when I make videos to like, <laughs> obviously to get it factual, to get all the information right. But even I, you know, I'll get a mis I'll make a mistake every now and then. What if one of my mistakes that I say in one of my videos is actually the thing that sticks around in 100 years, 200 years on the Internet, and then people just believe that as the fact? So there's always that fear that, um, you know, just something that's false is going to be left behind. So I guess when I think about AI generated content, yeah, there is a fear that some people will believe this stuff and then it will stick. it will stick longer than anything else. But there's also the fear that, something that we have already made uh, <laughs> that humans have been 100% responsible for is going to be the thing that sticks. So mm. anyway, I highly recommend that video. Does, uh, that, does any of that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I guess I, I would, I'd be curious to know like what are, I guess historically, what are the solutions to this, right? Because it's not a new thing, right? Like I remember growing up and people would tell me that Einstein was so intelligent that he didn't have space in his brain to remember how to tie his shoes, right? And like, th there's obviously solutions to combat little stuff like that. And I'm curious, like, do we need like a new form of authority for facts or like what? Well, it's supposed to be a history degree. I have one of those up on the wall here and I'm, people still don't believe me. I, I like, uh, <laughs> you know, like uh, it, it does, Credibility is a hard thing to build, but that, I think that's one thing that's helped me over the years is I've been doing this long enough. People are like, maybe this guy's not lying. Uh, and But that comes with media literacy. So kids, more than anything, I think in schools, they should be teaching media literacy from a young age, like how to research and, and just sort through, analyze, evaluate, um, synthesize information. Like if you have all this information you need to be taught all the time how to work with that information um, and not just to blindly trust anyone, but to use tools to, um, and it's a process. And th th the problem is it's work. And so that's also like the same reason why we, we get people in physical education is, you know, we get them in sports, kids in sports, because we want them to be physically active their entire lives, you know, and so it has to be practiced um, routinely by teachers in the classroom. Um, and that's why when I was teaching, it's like, hey, you're going to be the historian, you're going to be the detective, you're going to figure this out on your own. I'm not just like, I'm not going to just spoon feed you the information. Mm. You need to learn this on your own, because that's how you truly learn how to navigate. Um, so that's the solution. Also, though, it's fun to make uh, MythBuster type videos. You know, like I recently just released a video mm. uh, explaining that uh, Ellis Island. Um, like, let me just ask you. Uh, so, do you <laughs> think that Ellis Island is where a lot of people, immigrants, um, a lot of their names were changed? Did you ever hear about that? Immigrants coming to Ellis Island and they changed, they Americanized their last name, their surname. I've heard this. Yeah. Well, that's a myth that never happened, but it was, uh, for so many years, people just said it as if it was true. And then also it was in movies like the Godfather. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it's fun to like debunk that stuff. And so YouTubers like me will, and then, you know, like Napoleon, Napo like you mentioned the Einstein thing, Napoleon for years, everyone thought he was short when he was actually maybe above average height. Um, but we believed it because of the propaganda first pushed by the British, you know, uh, trying to basically make him i guess make i guess him make him look bad I, I thought he looked bad because of all the conquering and stuff uh i still haven't seen that movie by the way i still haven't seen <laughs> napoleon you yeah. know what's really interesting about this conversation in particular is sorry i, I there's a there's nothing i wanted to ask you but I'm trying to like remember it while also so uh, exactly what you're saying about like the 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 myth facts about history and whatnot and how like it's thanks to media that these things have propagated over generations, right? I feel the same way with artificial intelligence, right? 
because we have so many Hollywood movies that depict the doomsday event of, of the Terminator oh. walking the streets, right? And that's what's in people's minds when they see these headlines, right? But it, it's so, and, and, and it's very advantageous for a company to advertise their technology that way. Why? Because investors, they want in. They want to be the mm. first t- uh, Terminator robot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's kind of creepy, though. That's a <laughs> sociopathic. Hey, <listen. laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you think draws an investor to be an investor? Let's be real. No, oh, um, boy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyways, yeah, that was just really interesting. Like, you know, you have your domain expertise. And, like, you're, you're saying that, like, the media plays a role in, like, these myths, right? But I'm saying the same thing. Right. Anyways, that was an interesting point. I yeah. wanted to say, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'll give you. Well, a- no, it starts with humility. Like so much, so many of us just walk around thinking we've got everything figured out. And that, I think that sure. the first step is just like saying, hey, I know nothing. And sure. so tr- starting to, tr- I, I know people are like, oh, you're, just, you're a sheep. You blindly trust experts. I'm like, well, so <laughs> do you. What are you going to do? Be an expert at everything? That's not possible. No, no, no. They blindly trust experts <laughs> yeah 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 the experts they want to believe uh what were yeah. you saying though sorry i cut you off yeah so there's another question i wanted to ask you um i'm probably gonna forget about this point but uh it was about the fear of history uh oh the question was so so that's your fear and concern my question is what happens when your fear and concern hits critical mass oh critical mass yeah that's well, I mean, if you look at human history, we've arguably had those moments uh, where we've actually regressed. So that, yeah, no, I think that is something. Um, this actually is a great segue to my next question for you, though. That, so I'll just go ahead and ask it. Yeah, like. Sure. Um, yeah, change the ticker. Oh, yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so do you think. Um, generally speaking. <laughs> Uh, smarter people end up winning, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, clarify what I mean by that. I'm just gonna say, in the long term of human history, do you think generally the smarter people win, and why or why not? I don't think so. Oh, I, I honestly think it's it's a bell curve. Oh wow! Like, you, if you're too smart, then you have like all these caveats on like why you need to make it this way specifically or why a market might not like it. Like you might overthink it. And if you're too dumb, (laughs) you just won't act on it. Like you just don't, you won't have the, the, the ambition to act on it. Um, But if you're right in the middle, you're right in the middle where you're like not too smart, but not too dumb. That I think that's where most people win, you know? And this is like, I don't have data. You know, it's just kind of like my when I think about all the context throughout the successful people I could think about in my mind, it's just like the thing that immediately yells out at me. Well, that that that's the thing. We we always think of history as linear progress, but I mean, those who really dive deep into it know that yeah, we're constantly it's constantly two steps forward, actually three steps backward. Like we regress sometimes as a as and it's not, it's different around the world, different times, different places. I get it. But, um, you know, we even have a term for it when it's kind of happened in parts of Europe, the dark ages, you know, that's the most recent example where we saw, oh, all of a sudden, like there's this kind of regression of sort in some, in certain places now, uh, in the middle East, it, it was still progressing, but, uh, yeah, like, I guess that kind of backs up what you're saying is that, yeah, um, <laughs> Because if we just trust the smart people all the time, then you would think that we would just keep on this linear progressive path, like keep learning from our mistakes and then society gets better. Sure, there'll be new problems, but we'll just deal with those later on. We're just solving the problems right now. (laughs) Wait, what do you mean by trust the smart people all the time? This sounds like a different question. Oh, when I say smart people, I mean like experts in whatever field. So I always, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about climate change, as I said earlier, like, so we have climatologists that study this stuff their whole lives. Um, oh, and okay. we still have people that just like, no, I don't, I'm not going to believe you. And so, you know, um, we have 
people that are, I don't want to use the word dumb, but they don't know as much about climate as somebody that does it. But the, there's more of those people that don't know. And those people could just, they could win. And so then that's, that's a, yeah. Okay. I think I, I misunderstood your question. But oh, okay. If, if I understand you correctly, are you saying what people we should listen to more, more often or like, what do you mean by win? Or smart people. <laughs> yeah. And when, when I, well, that, I didn't, I intentionally didn't say what I meant by win on purpose because I didn't want to like lead you, Okay. you know, because when I say when though, what I guess I'll go ahead and say it. like, I just, I'm talking about the species, like the survival of, of our species. It's naive to think that we're going to be around forever. Um, we, I, I'm hoping that human beings have a good run. But the fact is that we've we like to make mistakes as a species that and when we talk about saving the planet, we're not we're not even really saying that we're, we're saying protecting our species. We shouldn't even frame it that way. It's never saving the planet. It, yeah. The planet is yeah. our home. <laughs> so it's, it's really saving us. And I, there's a lot of people that have a lot of power that um, just are they're causing our species to lose. Hmm. Hmm. That fascinates me. I'm just like, wow, we are letting people screw us all over. We just let we're oh. going with it. It fascinates me. <laughs> really interesting. Really, really interesting. I, I think I took it in a different direction. I would say that, like, I would say the, the reason why these people are in power is a, is indicative that they've already won, first of all. Okay, okay. And second of all. I would say that the reason why they're there is because they're not the smartest, but they're also not the dumbest. Ah. They're, they're on the bell curve in the middle, right? Yeah. And, and I, I don't know. There's like a term for this where it's like uh, you're, you're, what is it? You're, you're too dumb, so you, you're over com, uh, overconfident. And you're too smart and you're not confident enough. I, oh, I don't the Dunning-Kruger? Dunning-Kruger? Is yeah, that what you're talking you about? Go. Yeah, the Dunning-Kruger <laughs> effect, right? Yeah, yeah. And so you need someone in the middle where it's like, yeah, listen, I don't know too much, but I'm willing to explore and find some stuff out, right? With all their flaws, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how you get like someone like an Elon Musk, right? Like yeah. Elon Musk is, is a very like intelligent person in some regards, but also a very dumb person in, in other regards, right? Yeah, that's the thing. I think that's another thing that's probably not brought up enough is that intelligence is uh, measured in different ways. Uh, right. There's... um emotional intelligence there's social intelligence which are both of those are underrated in my opinion yeah um yeah uh there there's that graph that you're <laughs> yes yes no okay yeah this is interesting to me uh i i think that we could actually explore that for hours as well because it's like it depends on what specific issue we're talking about right but then of course you know oppenheimer came out last year that and that Nuclear weapons has been on people's minds, uh, especially with what Russia, you know, with the war and uh, them invading Ukraine. It's like, well, you know, we have people smart enough to create weapons that can destroy the world. Um, and that's where it seems like it kind of for the first time in human history, like, oh, like the people because like if they were really the smartest people, maybe they wouldn't have made them to begin with. You know, like Oppenheimer yeah. didn't even know right. if he was going when they were te first testing it. He didn't know if it was going to just destroy everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, listen, this crazy. is a very valid point. And I think that this is like a huge point of contention that a lot of people have in the modern day with like DEI and stuff like that. The diversity, equity, inclusion. stuff. So this is like the exact point that you're trying to drive, right? Is that you can get a bunch of really smart people, really competent people, really uh, passionate, talented people into a room, but there's always going to be potholes in, in whatever they're making, right? To your point, if you would have got someone in the room uh, with Oppenheimer that had like a bit more foresight on, I don't know, maybe history or maybe uh, uh, human lust and desire, maybe they'd be like, hey, this is probably not the best idea to do, but they didn't have that person in the room, right? And I think that like, one of the biggest problems that we have with like intelligent people or people who've won is we lean too much on them for too many things, right? I think Elon Musk is a great example. He owns SpaceX, he owns Tesla, he now owns Twitter. I'm not calling it X, 
He owns Boring Company. He owns so many different things, right? Which is fine. That's great. But to go to him for solutions for all these things is where I think a lot of us make mistakes. Like, yes, he can be smart and and uh, versatile when it comes to creating electric cars, right? Maybe even extend it out to making rockets, right? But then when you talk about owning a social platform where, where the entire world engages on, intelligence has boundaries. You know what I mean? Um, it's that blind faith that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, that kind of leads to another question too, though. Like, I'm sorry, we have to keep sidetracking here, but like, I, you know, we usually think of evidence that that we are. Sorry about the water. Uh, that, that the smartest uh, people <laughs> are winning because the human species overall is, so, well, supposedly thriving because there's so many of us. There's more than eight billion of us now, so things must be going well. But then the counter to that is like, well. Look at all the people that are suffering in the world, all the people in poverty, uh, people that have malaria, all yada, yada. So that's, I guess, just a philosophical discussion separate from all this is, yeah, what does winning mean? <laughs> so, but I, I intentionally didn't want to tell you my definition. Sure, sure. Fair enough. I think we ended there. Um, but yeah, right. of course, winning is a very complicated thing. Like, what is a winner if there are zero losers? Right. Like, oh, it's yeah. Very complicated. oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I think it's your turn. Oh, right. Okay. 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 We had, we're on eight, so I can choose only two of these. Let's see. <laughs> I want to choose wisely. I only have two more out of the seven that I have. Oh, maybe we'll just do a sequel, a, a bonus episode or something. The problem is around the three hour mark is when I really got to go pee. And so fair enough. That, that's the problem. That's why I, <laughs> yeah. I should probably get back to work too at that point. Oh yeah. So. Okay. I have, I have my question. Um, shucks is a tie, whatever. I'll just go for it. Uh, no, this one's more interesting. Okay. <laughs> so given everything that you know about like economics and history and et cetera, et cetera, what would you say it would take for Bitcoin to replace the U.S. dollar? Oh, yeah. No, I've been following Bitcoin for a long time. I was somebody back in 2012 uh, trying to convince my uh, wife, hey, let's buy some. And she's like, you know, like, what? Uh, Should have bought some. Anyway, uh, I did buy some later on. I do. I do have some, just very little. Um, and uh, the thing is. It was like the whoever created it, which we still some person said they were the creator. I don't think it's been proven that they did. But whoever created it, um, the whole point was it, for it to be an alternative currency to challenge um, the fiat currency that governments produce. It was supposed to be international. It was supposed to be something that was uh, made it so that commerce was decentralized. And yeah, the dude was probably I say, dude, it could have been a dudette or it could have been a they or whatever. They could have been uh, just a libertarian, you know, they probably were. Um, but regardless, um, I do think we're far away from that original intent um, because whoever created, I mean, all cryptocurrencies and they're all competing against each other. That's what, I mean, they're all, which I think is good. The more competition, the better. But it's just so difficult to compete with uh, fiat currency that's issued by a government. I mean, especially... <laughs> the most powerful government to arguably ever exist in, uh, in the history of the world, the United States government uh, and the Chinese government, which is, uh, is catching up from behind it. So, and they, they do manipulate currency and they do have a lot of sway in terms of, I mean, just look at how so much of our economy now is not, uh, ha has nothing to do with politicians. It's just a uh, bankers that <laughs> they work at a bunch of banks in the federal reserve system and uh, that's why there's all these conspiracy theories about them because they have this much power. Um, but I think largely they're good people. They're just trying to do what's right. But yeah, when they decide to lower the interest rates or raise the interest rates, that ripple effect, holy crap. It, uh, I mean, I, I, I bought a house uh, last year and interest rates were climbing and I was like, oh, what are we going to do? Because like 
it's a it's a difference between thousands of dollars and you're just like yeah um it it is you can escape it and so i i do appreciate what they're trying to do with the bitcoin but i just still think it has as far as right now and in, in, in the foreseeable future it's just really an investment um tool like an, a way to invest your money that's not the stock market or bonds <laughs> do you have any cryptocurrency i uh, i buy and sell too often yeah no i when I say I have little Bitcoin, I don't even have one Bitcoin. I have yeah. much less than one Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a lot of money if you had one Bitcoin. How much is it? Oh, yeah, it's like $70,000 now, isn't it? Yeah. Holy yeah. crap. That's amazing. It is crazy how so many people got extremely wealthy from investing in Bitcoin early on, and they just sold it. And it's high, yeah. I think it's higher now than it's ever been. It's crazy. It's so, a double. So you don't see a future where it could potentially... Let's not say replace. Replace is pretty extreme. What about like go toe to toe? Uh, not near term, but long term, I do. I still am optimistic long term that it might be a while, though. I think the people, the creators of these cryptocurrencies were thinking that it would move along faster than it has. But uh, yeah, and yeah, it would probably still, I think government issued fiat currency is still going to be around. Um, but there's something really, a lot of people that criticize um, cryptocurrencies, I don't think truly think about what fiat currency is. I mean, it's it's all made up. Money is made up. Sure. And when we really accept that, then like it's just about our perceptions. <clears throat> and so you get enough people that have the same perceptions, <laughs> that's it. So it's- Well, it's also about like who, who point. like what's backing it, right? Well, supp yeah, supply and demand. So that's another, the other brilliant thing about Bitcoin is that um, supply is limited. Occasionally they there's a little bit more that's mined out. Um, and then there's a certain point where there will no, no longer be any more mined out anymore. I think it's within 10 years now. I don't know the exact year. Somebody in the chat can say, but once that happens, it, it will, the value will even go further up. And so, yeah. And it's all, um, the, the, I think the, the biggest, I know, I know I'm starting to sound like a Bitcoin bro, like, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, like hyping it up. But I mean, the, the, uh, the blockchain really is it. That was the missing thing. I think that really you know where it's all accounted for. And the thing you can't say about fiat currency a lot of times is that it's all accounted for. Sure, <laughs> so I think sure. that's why I still have faith in it. And uh, you, people can make fun of me all they want. I don't care. But I think that is, I think cryptocurrency is a big part of the, the future of economies around the world. Nice. Yeah. So... So invest in advice from <laughs> Mr. B. <laughs> no, no, no. This is not a financial <laughs> advice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're up to question nine. If you're just now joining us, thank you. Uh, I got a pretty. We got a lot of viewers here. They must love you, Jabril. Um, <laughs> thank you. But yeah, uh, subscribe if you're not subscribed to. Um, it's just Jabril's when you search. And my next question. Which one should be last? Um, yeah, I'll do this one next. Okay. If you could upload your consciousness to a cool server and live on it perpetually, would you? And for how long? <laughs> you know what gave me this idea? That Black Mirror episode. Have you seen Black Mirror? Yeah. yeah the episode yeah, yeah. where, yeah, they, down, they, they download their consciousness and, um, and it's like a really cool like beachside uh community and it's just paradise basically and they just live there their consciousness is downloaded or uploaded there i guess is it the latest season uh it's like the third season what's the name of that episode here i'll, I'll search i haven't seen the the last season so it's not the it's... last season it's okay. uh let me see is it the one where their eyes like turn like light blue or whatever uh i don't remember yeah, yeah, it's um, been a I while. Can... Okay, it's season oh, season Juni... three, episode four. Junipero. Junipero, that's yeah, the one. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. Yep. Okay, so cool. yeah, I'll ask the question again. I got you off track. So again, if you could do that, upload your consciousness to a cool server, mm -hmm. uh, and live on it perpetually, would you? And for how long? Um, if I knew that there were, hmm, I I would. Okay. Uh, for the rest of my life. 
what do you mean for the rest of your life? Like, <laughs> I mean, so, so I have to make some assumptions on how the technology works. Right. And I, I'm assuming that I, my, my natural body still has to exist. Right. Well, I'm no, assuming. wait, wait, wait. I think in the show, it didn't really, it didn't really solve that. It, I think it just said like it, it was able to extract it and put it on a server. And so it, your body doesn't have to exist. I think as long as that server exists. Okay. Then yeah. Well, in that case, I, I would wait until I'm like about to on my deathbed or something like that. I mean, I'm rolling the dice because who knows if I my oh, if it will survive. Yeah, but then once you I guess the more compelling part of it is once you are there, how long would you stay there? Um well you said as, as long as the server exists, right? Then as long as the server is there, then I'll be there. Oh. You don't think uh, it's to it's oh this dang ad here. Um, you don't think it's a thousand years is too long to live? Because I think there's a certain point where it's like, okay, I've seen everything I need to see. I felt everything I need to feel. Maybe it's time to expire now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like no. Oh, I mean well, I, I need to I need to see the contract on like what it entails. <laughs> but like, if I keep all the same skills I have, like creating apps and games for a thousand years sounds so fun i would love that yeah there's just so much we want to do isn't there yeah that that's the thing like i have a list of video ideas that's right. endless yeah and i think that helps but i don't know maybe after you reach the age of 650 you're just like okay i don't the passion's gone and i guess it's hard to predict that but i imagine there's a reason why human beings have a life expectancy that we do or maybe there's something that's there like well uh and yeah there's a definitely they it, one of the the keys to a longer life expectancy is um having the purpose uh especially within a community so as if you have that if you have a purpose in a community if that community is dynamic it's you know like things are constantly changing in that environment you know it's not just well, stale I think one of the biggest things that we aren't addressing about this uh, this fantasy, right, is that I think one of the biggest reasons why I, I probably when I get older, be like, OK, let's let's wrap this up. It's just the degradation of my body, my physical body. Right. Yeah. Like, even at 32, I'm at like I'm like, I wish I had my 20 year old body now. Right. So I can't imagine yeah. at 80. But if I'm in a server where like that's not a problem anymore, like, dude, give me a thousand years. I don't care. I'm going to do backflips every day. I'm going to do jiu-jitsu and all types of stuff you know i just, well what about ten thousand years listen as long as i got my peak form body peak form brain bring it on let's do it let's all go. right i just think it's hard to wrap our head around i i also like in many religious beliefs the belief is the afterlife lasts forever and forever is really something that trips me out to think about um how, how many years is forever i'm it's like a lot. <laughs> so maybe that's why I, because uh, yeah, that's, uh, I just think there's an end to everything. And uh, always curious, like, well, where is that? Where is that end? You know, if you didn't, if you didn't have uh, limits to your human body. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I think there's a lot of questions that for sure need to be, you know, sussed out. But like, if you play a video game today, you know, how did they know you turned off the system for eight hours? You know, I didn't, how did they know? They don't know, you know. Um, <laughs> but obviously, we're we're talking like very hypothetically speaking here. Yeah. Well, watch Black Mirror, everyone, if you haven't seen it. It's one of my favorite shows. Ah, <sighs> all right, you're up. My turn. Okay. Is there a such thing? As a political center. Oh, as a grill. Yeah, it's me. Hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> it depends on the issue, but yeah, there is. Um, there is no political center, I think, um, in terms of all issues. But that's the problem, right? Because we always think of ourselves like on a spectrum between political parties or just you know, broadly speaking, even the political compass, it's just, there's just two spectrums there. Um, 
but I think the pro- one of the big problems with with how we talk about politics is we just talk about it broadly, and we uh, we like to be identified by these broad groups. Like, oh, wow, I'm an anarchist, or don't take that out of context. Stop that. No, um, I'm a Republican. I, you know, we're but they instead we should be thinking it's like, oh, um, where do you stand on? Um, minimum wage do you think there should be no minimum wage do you think there should be a really high minimum wage i mean the vast majority of people would be somewhere on that spectrum they wouldn't be on one end or the other um and so you do that issue by issue um i think there's some issues where you definitely would have more people that are far to one side like for example murder i think uh the vast majority of human beings think murder is wrong and uh, it should be illegal Um, But then there's other issues where, I mean, uh, most issues actually, where, yeah, most of us would be kind of grilling. We wouldn't know it by the polarization of uh, society and today, but yeah. So that's why when you take a political test, have you ever taken a political test before? Like one of those uh, online ones? I'm not sure. Um, I recommend uh, the 16, uh, there's, uh, I think it's 16 axes um, is the name of it. Let me see here. It's been a long time since I took it. Uh, oh, 12 axes. Sorry. Uh, this is what it looks like here. The Because it, it's really, it's 12 different spectrums. And it places you somewhere on those spectrums. And it's a much more accurate um, political test. Mm-hmm. Really gets you reflecting more on your own political beliefs. And it, it also, yeah, like it shows that, hey, we have more in common than we realize when we take political tests like this versus just like, I'm going to pick the Republican team or the Democrat team. And that's it. You know? Yeah. Uh, you didn't answer the question. <laughs> Is there a political center? Is there such thing? Only on specific um, issues. So like. Uh, what do you mean by that? So, okay. See, um, let me pick one from here. So, uh, We'll say markets. That's a good, keep it with the economics themed. So you can be perfectly in the middle between a command economy and a uh, market economy. So command economy just means the government makes all economic decisions. It's top down. Market economy is the opposite of that. It's bottom up. The individual, the consumer makes all economic decisions. Most countries are actually in between. And so I truly think that you could have, which I, I think an example of a truly mixed economy, which all, all economies are pretty much mixed, except for maybe North Korea is very <laughs> leaning towards command. But uh, yeah, you could say like, okay, Denmark is a right in the middle. They have figured out the balance between what government should, uh, what economic decisions governments should make for the general public and what the individual should make, which, which uh, economic decisions in terms of, you know, and it's it's finding that balance. And you can be right exactly in the middle on that specific I issue. I see. I see. You're saying, okay. So you're saying like there's no broad, like encapsulating center, but no issue to issue. There's, I see. Okay. Yeah. I see. That makes sense. I think I agree with that. I, I <clears throat> have a, a big issue with, uh, when people identify as left, right, and center. Um, <laughs> so do I. Trust me. <laughs> the label is just so... Like, you just sell yourself so short. I have a friend who tells me all the time that she will never date a Republican. She will never date a Republican. And it's like, I have Republican friends who identify as Republican. I have friends who identify as Democratic. Or Dem- whatever it is. And, <laughs> like, the values within both identities vary so much like they have stuff in common they have stuff not in common but my friend just blanket you're republican i don't care what your values are i'm not it's like ah (laughs) that's the polarization that's you know perpetuating in society american society specifically like because it's not necessarily that case everywhere around the world but uh yeah and you know for me i always tell people hey i actually lean to the right on certain issues um but I would say more issues I lean to the left, but, and that's why when I, um, because I make 
social science videos. It's not a perfect science. There's bias everywhere. Whenever you interpret history, you're trying to share a story. You're going to leave stuff out that you, the way you frame the story is going to make it seem like somebody's worse than they maybe really are, or somebody's better than they really are, you know? And so like, I have to tell them my bias. Like if you're presenting history, um, on the internet, you have to let everyone know your political bias. And that's why I finally just, I did the live stream where I just took a bunch of political tests. And so they kind of know, and then people like, they think they're, um, they're really like, aha, I got you. When they like say that, I, Oh, Mr. Beats a libertarian or whatever. And I'm just like, well, if you want to actually see where I stand on, on issues, just watch this stream and then you'll know, like, and there's no reason to just like, uh, rally behind me or rally against me because, this is where I'm coming from. <laughs> yeah. You know, if I were president, I would make it mandatory. Every single grade from kindergarten to 12th grade has to take a bias class. Every grade. <laughs> it's it's mandatory, yeah. especially in this day and age. Well, I did have my government students do it, and they, it was eye-opening for many of them because, you know, they're raised. Your, your parents shape your political opinions so much. My parents did, at least. I guess I can't speak for everyone, but, like, uh, yeah. And then when you actually start to think about issues like individual issues, not yeah. you get to the nitty gritty, but even like abortion, which is this s such a divisive issue. But when you really kind of look at a case, something case by case, you'll find that most people actually end up agreeing. <laughs> and the other thing, weird thing, like, well, that, well, that's what's crazy about the Supreme Court or our judges and uh, the court system in general is that it's really the what if branch of government, because. There's so many scenarios, so many possibilities that have things like just because you have a law doesn't mean, oh, OK, are we clear? Are we good? No, like uh, because they can't see everything coming. You know, <laughs> they can't predict the future with all these weird little um, nuances. Yeah. So, yeah, it's I, I would just say stop having an ideology, stop having absolute views and, and stop just blindly following teams. And then we'll be a much better society overall. Well, I think that's why like teaching bias is so important because like yeah, the, the example you just gave is like in a very his like uh like history political context, right? But it, it's so much more like far reaching than that, right? We live in the age of AI. Like bias is the most important thing when it comes to that technology. You know what I mean? On a day to day conversation you're having with a friend, I can't tell you how many people nowadays like cannot determine what is a fact you're trying to tell them versus an opinion you're trying to tell them. Like, I cannot tell you how many I, I, I just say an opinion. And if I don't say, well, I think, well, I believe, well, my opinion is they think that I'm telling them a fact. It's like, no, no, I'm just telling you my opinion. Like, relax. <laughs> but that's not a new problem. I mean, that's always been a problem that I guess the, the unique times we live in is that, that the information comes at you so fast. And but that's OK, because we can suspend judgment. We don't have to make up our minds immediately. On mo I mean, it's not like it's life or death that we know exactly where we stand on abortion right now. You got to know where you stand. But uh, the other the other counter counter to that, though, is like, oh, well, I don't know who to believe. So I'm just not going to believe anyone. Now, nah, we also got to teach that, you know, to be a responsible so citizen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's cowardly. <laughs> also, that's why I kind of talk trash about doomerism. It's just like, you know, you, you're a disgrace to our society if you're not even going to participate and just. You know, because like, yeah, it's like you're betraying your everyone, you know, when you just say, oh, you throw your hands up. You can't fix it all anyway. No, we need you. We are all in this together. Sure. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm starting to like um, preach a little bit. <laughs> now, listen here. <laughs> uh, OK, last question, right? Yep. Really, I got a pee anyway, so it always works out because I, nice. I drink the coffee all day and uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, so this is, yeah, I mean, you are a wonderful communicator. Um, you are very gifted at what you do in terms of, I mean, that's what you do. You're a communicator. I guess I am too. But uh, still that to my mom. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it crazy, though, how we, yeah, we struggle to communicate with our loved ones, but we are, can communicate to the masses. Uh, uh, but yeah, I digress. Uh, so the question is, if... Uh, when did you realize that you were meant to explain stuff to other people for a living? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, hmm. 
So we're about to dip into ego land a little bit. It's okay. Um, you know, I haven't thought about this in a while. I used to like have a very sharp point of answer for this when I was younger. But I remember specifically, there's a point in my life where I would look up to like traditional ways of doing things, right? Specifically, I wanted to like do media, right? And the traditional route was like, if you want to do media, you got to move to Hollywood or New York and then get into that scene and you can like do acting or producing or editing, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I was dabbling in that world and I, and I was realizing like all these people that I looked up to as a kid that are making these, 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 this content, right? Like films and commercials and et cetera, et cetera. I realized that everyone was just a, a, an idiot. <laughs> like everyone is just <laughs> dumb. Right. And they're all like learning as they go with everything that they do. And I was like, wait, hold on. I'm an idiot too. I, I can do this. And so I remember very pointedly, that was when I realized that like, if, this person can do this. I can do this. And yeah, I just worked incredibly hard to, you know, make stuff that I, I, that was appealing to an audience. And here we are today. Well, and then like, I guess when, like, cause you started out, I mean, you've, you've made videos for a long time. Very long time. <laughs> so, but you, you've had different um, genres, like you did comedy videos but um how did it i don't even know the this the story on this i guess I might as well ask you like how did you begin working with uh diana for example very lucky very very lucky encounter oh. man oh man oh man i'll tell you my early year stories i, I i'm actually astonished that everything fell into place like it did but to make a long story short i um <laughs> where should i begin it's just kind of interesting I'll, I'll i'll tell it as brief as possible yeah so I was working at a radio station at the time, right? I was maybe 23 or something like that. And I was also producing a prank channel at this time, right? So it was like supplemental income to the to the radio station I was working at. Minimum wage at the radio station, they did not pay me well. And the prank channel did not generate like good revenue. Like if I was lucky, I'd see like $1,000 a month from the prank channel, right? But it was enough to live off of. But something happened where the pranks at that time were just... The, the barrier to entry was so low that anyone could grab a camera and do anything and get an audience, right? And a lot of people caught on to this. And so I remember specifically, it was this, this dude who lived in the UK. He did this prank called throwing acid in people's face prank. This was like right after this actually had happened, like a terrorist attack had happened in the UK. And he thought it would be funny to go around throwing water in people's faces as, oh, as if God. it was an actual... And so he made this video. It went terribly viral. And now all these press, they're like, YouTube, this is your platform. Why do you allow this to happen? Why is he making money? So overnight, they clapped all prank channels across the board. Every single prank channel was demonetized, could not make money. And I was running a prank channel at that time. Oh, gosh. And so overnight, I'm like, okay, you know, this thing I've been building for the past two, three years is now done, right? What do I do now? And my friend who also had a prank channel, had pivoted before this had happened. He was making like interview content. And he was like, hey, I want you to come work with me. Uh, I really like the way that you you edit content, the way that you uh, film, et cetera, et cetera. So I go quit my job at the radio station, which was my only real source of income at that time, to go work for him, right? And I promise you, we're almost done. We're almost done. No, you're fine. Um, and... I'm filming for him. I'm doing some editing for him because his channel is doing really well at this point. But stuff happens in his life where this thing blows up within the month. <laughs> within the month of me quitting my job and going work for him, his whole entire thing blows up. So now I'm just completely unemployed. No income, no nothing, right? And I'll never forget. So I, I'm doing everything I can. To, to make some income, but it's really difficult because, like, I lived in San Diego. There's not a big market for, like, media and stuff like that. And that's what I wanted to do. And I'll never forget, I had gave up. I quit. I was like, I'm done. I'm just going to cash it in, work a regular job, et cetera, et cetera. I go interview at this fabric store. And the, the, inter the interviewer pulls me into the office. And he goes, so tell me, why do you want this job? I tell him why I want the job. And he's like, oh, interesting. 
what are your dreams? What do you what do you want to do in life? And I tell him about the YouTube and the 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 programs and games and coding and stuff. And he tells me straight up, closes his book, and he says, "I'm not going to hire you." Straight, I I do not believe that you belong here. You you should be out there for working on your dreams. I bullshit you not. This is what he told me, and I left that that fabric store incredibly inspired. Wow! And so the Hancock not, fabrics. <laughs> it was Joanne's fabric. fabrics. Oh, Joanne, yeah, Joanne fabrics. Okay, uh -huh. yeah, I don't know if you guys have that, but who is Joanne's this person? That, wow, what a pivotal moment in your life. Tr true story, dude. So I leave there, and I'm just like, "What the hell? That's crazy!" And so from that day on, I just am like eight hours a day replying to Craigslist ads, replying to any any possible odd job as possible that's dealing with like editing, filming, uh, logo design, anything, right? And and I get to a point where I'm making like okay money, like okay, right? I'm still eating noodles and stuff. But one day I see this post that is saying that they run a YouTube channel and they need help. I think it's on Craigslist. And I replied to it. And then I said, hey, I this is rare in San Diego. Like people do not do YouTube in San Diego. And so I'm like, hey, I, this is really interesting. I would love to work with you. I actually produce a YouTube channel too. And I was doing the Ceph science stuff at the time. Happened to be Diana. Ah, physics and girl. Physics girl. And she sees it. She's like, oh my God, your content's great. Yeah, come, like, come, come, let's work something out. And so I go film with her one day. And like, from that point on, it was just, I worked with her for three years. She paid me really well and she helped me meet people. It, it was amazing, man. But <laughs> speaking of Diana, we, the edgy tuber community is, we think about you every day. Yeah. <laughs> She's been going through some hard times, uh, so uh, we wish her the best. But wow, what a story that is! Yeah, yeah. I, I love Diana. I miss Diana. I can't wait for her to get better. Um, yeah, yeah. We I, I met her uh, once or twice. Uh, so sweet, and uh, maybe that's how I met you. Actually, <laughs> one of those first EduTuber conferences. I, yeah. I tell you, I wouldn't be there without Diana. I'll tell you that straight up. I always like, yeah, it's weird who, I mean, that's why it's just good advice to just be nice to everyone and then say yes more than you say no if you're having fun. You know, if you're having fun, you can always like just quit later on. It, it's it's kind of like, you know, riding a roller coaster. You know, it's like, oh, this is a lot of fun. Sometimes it goes down and it's really fun. <laughs> it goes up and it's like, or I guess the opposite, if you think of it, and then if the metaphor expands and you're just like, oh, there's good times and bad times. But as long as you're still having fun, you stay on the ride. Right. right. Uh, and I'm still on the ride with YouTube as well. I, honestly, I had a similar situation with leaving teaching because I was like, I don't know. That's a big gamble to like leave your benefits and you, I'm supporting a family. And <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's so far it's worked out. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And then uh, I guess you have one more question for me too. <laughs> I do, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to cheat. All right. Hopefully this is the first time in, in your cast history. This has happened. Okay. I'm going to throw two questions at you and you reply to the one that you think is more interesting. Entertaining. This never happened before in an episode of 10 questions, folks. This is Let's get a it. historic moment. Let's get it. Okay. <laughs> On a history channel, making history. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, so my first question is, what is the most underrated historical event to happen? My second question is, we now live in a global economy. Is another Great Depression even possible? Oh. Um, I feel like that second question is like, not as exciting for the audience. So I'll, I'll go with Fair the enough. first one. <laughs> Fair enough. The short answer to the second question is, yeah, I think it is possible, unfortunately. Interesting. Yeah, just because like we're all so connected these days and even more so than back during the 1930s. I mean, I'm actually answering both of them. See how sneaky I am? But wouldn't that become like an Omega depression? Like wouldn't the cascading effect be like so large that? Yeah. Well, but there are safeguards. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like we've learned and put safeguards in place to prevent that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because I guess the COVID-19 pandemic is an example of that, how we prevented another worldwide depression. So, yeah, you can make that argument because one thing, I mean, there's a lot of silver linings about that pandemic. And I think one of them is that 
We just straight up gave money to people who needed it. That's a huge thing. Yeah. And uh, other countries did the same. So, yeah, we prevented a much worse uh, recession slash depression, which is just really a prolonged recession is all that is. Uh, anyway, though, I want to go back to the, the spicier question. Uh, the most yeah. underrated historical event uh, in history. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I, if you were to ask me this question a few years ago, I would have probably gone with the nuclear uh, bomb development because, but now Oppenheimer, everybody, <laughs> everybody won't shut up about Oppenheimer. So I can't say that anymore. Oh, your thunder. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I'm glad that people, uh, it's such a popular movie and all that. But so just thinking a little bit here. Um, the thing I think about in, uh, in history, other than economics, a lot of times is um, the microscopic things that are constantly trying to um, kill us. And so, um, I know it gets a lot of attention, um, but still, I think the uh, the Black Death, um, the bubonic plague of the Middle Ages, uh, that that kills up to a third of Europe, it usually gets like covered one day in a world history class. I mean, one out of every three Europeans died from it. Uh, the fact that those who survived were immune. And then they went to the Americas and then they spread disease over there that later would, like I said earlier, wiped out 90 to 95 percent of Native Americans. Yeah, we, we should be constantly with the heck with the Roman Empire. We should be constantly thinking about the bubonic plague and the fact that uh, and really all of like vaccine history, like th this whole recent rise of um, the anti-vax movement that I've, we've especially seen since 2020 with, you know, people not getting the COVID-19 pandemic or vaccine, uh, has been really disheartening because it's an astounding demonstration of just ignoring history. If people truly knew how bad polio was or smallpox, the measles, um, malaria, which still is a big problem in parts of the world. I mean, vaccines, clean drinking water, good gravy. That That's... That's the other thing other than asteroids and uh, climate change that's going to kill us all. But then again, it's related to climate change because we, we will see new diseases that we're not immune to. We're going to see more pandemics. And if we're not learning from history, I mean, for crying mm. out loud, the biggest thing that doubled the life expectancy within the last hundred years mm. was vaccines and better nutrition. Those two things alone doubled the life expectancy. We didn't have kids dying. And so hmm. that's always, yeah, just, I have a book, I have a book, I recommend it. Uh, oh, I can't find it. I, there's a, yeah, there's a book I got uh, a while ago from, it's just as a gift or something. And it just goes through all the major um, epidemics, uh, pandemics from around the world. And it's weird because like, you know, they don't happen that often. And, it, and because of that, we forget like, we didn't know about the Spanish flu the, uh, that happened. Uh, a lot of people know about World War I, but they, they don't bring up the fact that more people died during World, World War I from the flu than from actually combat, from getting hit by bullets or bombs. <laughs> so, yeah, you got me on some rants. So thank you for that. No, I, I love it. Yeah. yeah. I love it. That I, Honestly, like, I don't even think about that that often, like, yeah, oh, we yeah. had COVID, but uh, there should be mandatory over... disease history classes. <laughs> In addition to uh, one out of three is pretty. That's pretty severe. I, I didn't yeah. know that. I just knew it killed people. <laughs> like, well, then just it. think of the implications of that afterwards. The survivors, like this, is one of the things that um, ultimately helped end the feudal feudalism across Europe because they began to like, oh, you didn't have to like. It wasn't just the nobles now that were getting in on the um the action for making money from <laughs> agriculture uh so they were getting more people were getting land and all of a sudden like you weren't just born into a certain uh you know uh part of the hierarchy the social hierarchy anymore so it upended things that's a big part of the effects of the bubonic plague of the 1300s and actually uh, led to the renaissance which then led it to the 
eventually to the Enlightenment and scientific revolution. And here we are with vaccines. So it all is connected. Ikea meals are the best. I love eating at Ikea. School principal. Are you a, re a real school principal? That's amazing. Um, we're going to wrap things up. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Jabril, for being here. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Uh, everyone watching, if uh, again, subscribe to uh, his channel. It's in, in the description of this video. And if I forgot to put it there, I'll. that's the first thing I'll do after uh -huh. I go to the bathroom. <laughs> I appreciate so, yeah. that. Uh, anything else you want to promote that um, your next video or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got a video coming out really soon. Um, I made an app that is a game where you can test your confidence in picking an AI agent out of a lineup of five strangers. Oh, wow. So that's coming out soon. Um, and I, I also have a very serious project that I'm working on. You can see a top link right there, hexra.io slash UB early. Um, I don't know if you know how much app games make if you take it serious um raid shadow legends has made like a hundred million dollars since it launched in 2019 <laughs> they should have paid me more for that sponsorship <laughs> then <laughs> that's yeah, crazy they, they made a lot of money um so wow. I, i'm also working on a really serious app that is a lot of fun it's, it's chess inspired but uh imagine chess if it were a shonen anime fight so and that's hacksword.io slash play you be all right yeah uh i appreciate you for having me man this was really fun Real, yeah no i wanted wanted to have you for a long t on for a long time especially since i went down you know obviously ai rabbit holes and i was like oh i should ask your brill about this and i didn't want to just send it in a you know twitter message so <laughs> it's great to glad actually to, glad to uh, like this yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, everyone watching, thanks for being here and have a great rest of your day, week, month, year, decade. Bye-bye. <laughs>